just in case something goes wrong, uh, you can also, of course, jump to YouTube over if you kind of get kicked out from Zoom for whatever reason. And you'll find a lot of stuff and a lot of examples and a lot of things that we're going to go through dutifully prepared and put together by myself. So hopefully you will find yourself lost over there, at least partially. We'll see about that. So a lot of stuff happening over here, right? Uh, so feel free to explore. And I'm hoping I have a sense that Jan or Anastasia or Tatiana maybe will put a link in the YouTube chat as well for wonderful people who are joining us over there um, to jump in too, right? Okay, and we already have it in the chat over here as well. And if you could also drop it in the YouTube chat, that would be nice. All right, so four minutes, everyone, four minutes, and then everything is going to be different. Well, I'm not sure about everything, but some things will definitely be different. If only my keyboard was connecting, it is, but it's not. So it's, it's a big timer just for anybody who's going to watch us later. So you know what to expect to start okay uh, and with a wonderful advertising in german uh, because why not right uh, fantastic so welcome welcome everyone please take a seat coffee snacks water slides whatever pleases you All right okay so let's see how this goes very excited to see how it's going to come along over here and if you happen to be in uh, youtube Chat, please also write a story of your life in 20, no, in 20, in 80 characters or less. That would be nice. Uh, and hello, 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 everyone. All right. So let me make sure I'm closing everything I don't need. I think, Raphael, you might be surprised by some things I'm going to show, right? because it might be related to the European Parliament as well, so that will be fun. All right, here we go. I can't change my slides now. Okay, here we go. That is done, 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 done. Closed, closed, closed. Good, excellent. Three minutes to go. So I better prepare my slides. Just a moment, everyone. So, da -da -da -da. Okay. And of course, I'll explain how it's going to work and the recordings and the slides and everything. So don't worry if you just jumped in. Uh, we are still waiting for a few people to join us. And welcome to the wonderful people on the internet, on YouTube. Wonderful to have you here as well. I think that Marsha has a wonderful story of her life in eight emoji. That's incredible. I think that's really incredible. Okay, here we go. Okay, I think I got that covered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just going through the slides to make sure I don't miss anything important. Okay, so two minutes, everyone. Get ready. We won't have much time. I mean, just two hours, two and a half, so that's nothing. Although, I think that Amanda and Jan will probably let me know if I go like for five hours instead of two. I'll do my best to not go that far. I, I got a nod from uh, from uh, Amanda, so I will be stopped. Right. I want to be respectful of everybody's time as well. All right. So one minute, everyone. One minute. So, do you feel like you know crashing fig jam with I don't know a thousand people? I'm a little bit afraid of that. I don't know. Um, what can you do with a thousand people, by the way? I don't know. Magic. I'm sure we can do some magic together. Like, could get all the incredible people here together in one single room. That's unbelievable. That's um, pretty cool. We can do a lot of stuff. All right. 30 minutes, and then we officially kind of start. We better do because we are running out of time already. Okay. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, okay. <gasps> Please do not corrupt 
the Google Talk. That's almost holy. Uh, all right, 15 seconds. Right, and to welcome everyone, I do apologize a lot if it's been a little bit too loud, but you know, the gong, it's not supposed to be, you know, calm. So here we go. Uh, welcome, welcome to the wonderful two hours plus extra time, I guess, session, uh, when we're diving into all the wonderful, miraculous things about search. I mean, search? Why would you do that to yourself? Like spending two or two and a half hours talking or discussing or reviewing or debating and improving search there are definitely more fun parts than that in life but we will dive into this before we start uh welcome first of all everyone we have a google doc right and welcome to the wonderful people on the internet joining us on youtube as well right uh well first of all we have a google doc that's quite significant and i think that it's going to be posted on youtube and here on zoom as well right where you'll find everything and more probably so you'll find things like slides, all slides are uploaded. Feel free to download them right now and you can take a look and see, um, you know, use them later. They'll give them to your friends and neighbors and strangers. I don't mind. Uh, we're all friends over here, right? Um, also, there is a little video course we put together and we'll mention that later. So you can use a little coupon code over here. We'll do a lot of stuff today, but we're going to dive into all the fine details all around search, all around design KPIs partially as well with a lot of examples. Don't worry, you don't have to take screenshots or kind of make notes of it all. I've put them all together over here. So you can actually jump through them as well if you want to. Then there is the same stuff for filters. Like for each of those, I put together this little bold link, which is kind of a quick summary of pretty much everything I'm mentioning about this. So, and a lot of examples, design systems and patterns and things like that, all right? And then more examples that I'm going to show. And that also goes then for sorting, and that also goes for navigation. This also goes for forms and for 25 other topics that we will not be covering today because there's a lot. If you like music playlists that I'm going to play, you know, somewhere in one hour, 15, because we're going to have a short break because I want you to breathe and drink water. Anybody didn't drink water? Please drink water now. That's probably the most important thing you learn from this uh, workshop, right? And uh, what else? Right, we also have a Slack channel. And if you have questions, because of course we have also wonderful people from YouTube joining us, please feel free to drop your questions in Collaborative Doc over here. That's just a place for all of us to put notes, takeaways, questions, resources, screenshots, or whatever together. I'm sure that this is kind of also tracking and monitoring YouTube chat, but this is probably easier uh, to keep it together, right? All right, now we have enough people, I think, that we can start. First things first, what, what, sorry, where are you connecting from today? Could you just write it in the chat if you could? Very nice. And while you do that, one thing I always forget to mention is, of course, everything is going to be recorded and you're going to get it whether you want it or not via email along with slides and everything else that I have, right? Because I know that you might be joining in later or you might be leaving, leaving, leaving eventually. Okay, the speed of chat is a little bit too fast for me. I don't know why I can keep track, uh, but I assume that everybody is represented and that's wonderful. Oh, Sabrican was there. I was studying in Sabrican. Oh, wow, that's uh, impressive. It's like, <sighs> I feel nice. Okay, so we better start, right? We're not running out of time already. So, uh, dear friends, let's take a look at what we can do with search, I should say, right? Because when we're thinking about search, usually we'll be thinking about a magnificent search box. Search box, how can search box be difficult? And why would it be difficult? And how would we even kind of try to improve it? Because haven't we resolved it now? I mean, we've been doing this design slash UX slash something thing for like what, 20, 25 years? I mean, we should be able to design a proper search box and a proper search box experience at this point, right? I mean, we should be. So let's see how people search first. Then let's see what design patterns we can apply. Then we'll see how we actually can merge or use filtering and sorting and search together and how they all are kind of connected. That also then goes for autocomplete. And then we'll see how it all kind of frames this nice, beautiful, uh, good well, search, good search experience in 2024. 
And we'll start really by diving into search and how people actually use search. And that requires us to kind of ask one very simple question. Actually, when you're thinking about search, when do people search and when do people use navigation? Now, that seems like a very obvious question. Feel free to write in the chat, of course, as well, right? But overall, it's relatively straightforward. There is no magic over here, right? When people have a very pretty good, and this is important, pretty good, not necessarily very good, but pretty good understanding or idea about what they're looking for, they use search. Mostly this could be exact queries, so it could be broader topic queries. For example, it could be something like climate change, which is relatively broad. It could be something like a you know, number of an item that people are buying or so. So that could be very specific, but it's definitely quite spe more specific than let's say just navigation, because people usually navigate when they're browsing, when they're exploring. Search is a bit different. It's kind of more focused experience. However, one thing that I really noticed quite a bit, oh, by the way, <laughs> I forgot to introduce myself. Hello, my name is Vitaly, and I've been spending over the, the last, yeah, I don't know, seven, 10 years, I guess, with just really relatively complex systems and enterprise systems and government systems and things like that. And so search was always a part of it. And I think that very often search is kind of underrated or maybe underutilized. We should be making more use of search because it's such an important part of the experience. So today I kind of want to cover some of the design patterns and ideas and things that I learned, my colleagues have learned, so we can all kind of put it all together. Okay, that's something I forget. Excuse me, my chaos, I'm nervous, maybe, or maybe not. Right, so back here, when we look into search, when we look into filtering, when we look into search, sorting, they are a part of a single experience. That's important. That's probably one of the most significant realizations I received over the years. Right, namely that when people think of search, they naturally almost think about filtering. They almost also naturally think about sorting, and they're not thinking about okay, I search first and then I need to go filtering and then I'm going to go sorting. It's often perceived as one single task. Sometimes even expecting sorting to appear in the filter sections, or filters appear in the sorting section. But typically, if we search, then we first search, then filter and then potentially sort in that order. That's actually quite significant. It's not like we usually search and then sort and then filter. It's least more common that we actually search, then we filter, and then we start sorting. And of course, if we look around, like this is a, a typical, the example of how it could be, right? IKEA, you got to search and then you get your suggestions with wonderful, beautiful, amazing, incredible autocomplete. And as you keep doing that, Eventually, you kind of realize, okay, this is something that I'm interested in, and then you get your results, right? And then we start filtering and or sorting. Because usually when you get a broad query, you get a lot of results. And sorting is not very relevant if you just get a lot of results, which are not necessarily relevant to what you're looking for. We'll get into that in a moment. Very typical, we all seen this. But it's important to understand that search can appear in very, very different shapes and forms. Here is search on the Met Museum website, and that's a search for the map, right? For, well, met for the entire experience within the museum where you can find where what is and how to jump to a particular section and how to get there, how to navigate there. It also gives you the preview of all the different options with and without stairs. And it seems to be looking nice. But whenever you start searching and you want to get from one place to another, every now and again, there is this bug, I guess, or so, where it just tells you there is no route for that journey. You're in one part of the museum, you want to get to another part of the museum. But there is no route. How can it be possible? Right? So when search is broken, then it's broken for good. Right? So if people can't find a way to get from A to B, that's a problem. That really is a problem. Of course, if you type in something that's um, very unusual, then you shouldn't be expecting any results. But here, if you type in, let's say, drawings or Turkey, right? what you might be expecting is an exhibition around Turkey, an exhibition around drawings. And it's there, but not well perceived. So when search breaks, that's a real problem, right? Here's another story, kind of a different pattern right there. This is the Ministry of Finances in Germany. And so when you start typing, or you kind of activate the text box, you get your suggestions. Fantastic, we've seen this a thousand times, right? And then you select one of the options and nothing happens. Just nothing happens. And you might think, oh, that's weird. Maybe I should refresh or what is going on? Well, because the way of how it's built is that you need to click on the search button to activate the search. 
right? That might be unexpected. And the reason why I'm showing this is because very often you end up in situations where you have very different expectations that people have from your system. And we as designers have very different expectations of how things should be. Now, you could have a big meeting and a big debate with your colleagues around, uh, you know, should it be activating by default or not, right? And there will be opinions for that and opinions against that, right? But there is no unique search experience that people have. It's just not how things are, right? You need to know one thing about me. I love postal service websites, and I mean it. Every Friday, I would, no, not every Friday, but every other Friday, I would go to postal service websites. This is the one in Iceland. My beloved, incredible Icelandic postal service website. If you happen to be from Iceland, warm greetings to cold Iceland from me. I love Icelandic postal service website. If you know anybody who is working for it, please say hello, right? And so we get this. Excellent, Tara, greetings to Iceland. We found each other. That's wonderful. That's amazing, right? So we get this search, which is kind of more of a different searching experience because here you might be expecting that you have this option here. Oh, let me just zoom in for a moment, right? So you basically want to be kind of searching, right? And here what, we, what we're doing is, well, it opens a drop down. So what most people would do in this kind of scenario is scroll down to find their country. Now, most of us would do something different because we are expert users, right? What we would do is start typing. I would be very concerned about us assuming that people just know that they need to start typing to find a shortcut to their country. Most people would actually be using that dropdown, scrolling up and down, potentially wasting an incredible amount of time, right? So this is why it's actually quite important that dread dropdown that we saw, right, that it actually is looking like uh, if you want people to type in there, that it feels more like an input box rather than a drop down. That is kind of one of the important parts to consider. But then things get really quickly, really complicated. So this is Eurolex. This is a big, big, big repository that gives you access to European Union law. Now, sometimes you have a lot of poor metadata. That metadata reflects itself in a poor search. So. You know, I've been working with different teams and very often you end up with this situation where you start talking about search and the first conversation that you have is, oh, right, our search is broken, so let's replace the search engine. I've never seen in my entire life any project where replacing a search engine would solve any search problems. Search engines are fine, right? You don't have to be Google or, or whatever to be successful in search. The problem is metadata. The problem is lack of proper categorization, lack of proper taxonomy, lack of proper information architecture. That's usually a much bigger underlying issue beyond that, right? So you can't really just fix it by replacing a search engine. So here on Eurolex, right, you basically type in Ukraine and you get Ukraine, but then you also get Ukraine 1, you also get Ukraine 2, you also get Ukraine 4. And then you might be wondering, are there a couple of countries I've been missing in my entire life? No, you did not. Right. And this is, again, kind of an indicator of an issue, because some people who actually plug in content for a particular topic, they kind of use this internal mechanism to maybe break them into different groups. This is that section of the site, Ukraine one, and that's two and that's three and that's four. Right. And so you get to the situation where it gets really messy because then it's surfaced to everyone who is using the site. So that becomes really quickly, really messy. But then very often it comes with extra costs, right? So this is a very common, relatively complex search. And I mean, actually, kudos to people who uh, work on that. And could you please not draw on my slides I'm presenting? <laughs> that would be lovely, right? Um, what happens is you actually end up in a situation where you have a lot of content that you're displaying, right? And you have a lot of filters, but that's not it. Because every now and again, what you also will end up with is an expert search or advanced search, right? Where you can actually customize your displayed information like you do over here right? We can actually customize what exactly is going to be displayed in search results, which, which is something that uh, many expert users will actually need, right? And then as you keep going, eventually you also get to this, which is if you look at the right upper corner, there is advanced search. Now, whenever we have regular search and advanced search, it becomes an issue because what is advanced and what is not? Should it be just one? Ideally, you wouldn't have two different search boxes which are kind of guiding you to different things. The only thing about the advanced search that makes it more advanced is actually search with more features, right? So I probably need to clean up 
um, somehow this red line if I only knew how uh, because we need to remove annotation. I don't know how if I can do that actually. Um, oh, here we go. Eraser. Please don't draw on my slides. I put them together with so much love and passion. Thank you. All right, let's close it back here. All right, so, and I'm not trying to kind of make fun of the site. It's just a very common example of things that often go wrong, right? Uh, just because of the metadata. And then sometimes you get really unusual experiences like here, Allegro, anybody from Poland joining us today? Yay to Poland, right? Because what we get here is two searches for the price of one. So you can search for Bose headphones, but then at the same time, you can also search for something else like uh, Samsung S10. You're like, uh, what? Why would you search for two things at the same time? Well, because the context here is different. What you're basically doing is you're looking for any merchants that have both of those items and can ship those items to you at the best price. That's a very unique use case, but it's a very good use case. That's very interesting. So you can have two searches in one search box. Right. So just examples of just how difficult and how versatile search can be. Right. And of course, if you start looking around, you'll find a lot of stuff. You can find category search, feature search, thematic search, site content search. Some people would use or utilize search, right, to search for help, right, or search a way to find a way to contact somebody or customer service. Some people were using it for symptoms instead of actually buying, like searching for particular products. Like for example, in the pharmacy, they will actually just write down what symptom they have and then search from there. Sometimes it's a history search, sometimes it's a refuse search where people are looking for refuse transactions, documents, photo, video, transcript. This can be a lot. And sometimes, especially in enterprise software, you get with this massive multi-sourcing experience where you start from one sorting and then you want to sort by something else and then the something else and something else. So that's complicated. Now, what it means for us is we need to kind of accommodate for every individual use case. But for that, we need to understand how people search because there are different patterns. Most of us will be familiar with the F pattern. F pattern is, you know, you basically start on the left over here and then you're basically scanning or reading, I should rather say, uh, the first few lines. And then as you keep going down the line, the page, kind of read less and less and less and less and you're basically scanning. Uh, F pattern is, not necessarily good for businesses because people usually omit or skip a lot of really important things. That's usually a big problem. So if you want to be to help people be a bit more effective or efficient as they are, you know, using your application or using your website, you probably want to avoid F pattern. Now there are others as well. Like there is, for example, the Z pattern where people actually go sequence one by one, one by one, which is a little bit not as popular, let's say, as F. Then sometimes you get a layer cake pattern where people are paying attention to something that stands out. That's extremely useful. So if you want to put some keywords, right, throughout your search results, well, we'll talk about them in a moment, right? This is a very efficient way of doing that with badges, with any kind of metadata that you want to highlight and so on and so forth, right? But this is also general. It doesn't act only for search. You also have the spotted pattern where people pay attention to specific spots. Marking pattern where people just take one area and then pay attention to that. Bypassing is basically almost random, right? They're kind of looking around for numbers or for addresses or some things that are really, really specific, right? And then commitment pattern, which happens. I didn't see any single person doing that, frankly, but there are people who take a website, uh, well, they take a cup of coffee, they sit down and they read their website from top to bottom. This happens as well. And this all is coming from wonderful research done by Normal Nielsen Group. So that's actually worth looking at. Now, let's explore how people search, right? Before, because before we actually dive into design patterns, we need to understand how people search. So what you see here is a video of a person searching, right? I want you to pay attention to that. There will be quiz afterwards, right? And then they basically land on a page. Not very surprising here. Right, and they keep going. What you see is eye gazes. And it's really interesting to see what's happening there. Can you write in the chat if there was anything that kind of surprised you? Because as you keep going here, I'm going to show it one more time. It's very important that we kind of get what is happening here, how people are searching. Of course, it's Google, but it will be very similar in any other search engine as well, an internal search engine too. It's like, what, 10, 12 seconds experience, right? And then they're gone to a separate page, let's say. 
right? I'm going to just quickly drop in and check the chat. Oh my, this is a lot of wonderful, wonderful people here. I think we might break the record of Zoom. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, so Hugh is saying they skipped the ads, they ignored the ads, they skipped the paid stuff, returns to the beginning, down and back up, reading the titles, um, is that pattern? Skip the info boxes on the search result page. Andrea said they skip thing that might look like ads. Indeed, pay more attention, like very close attention. We need to really understand every, it's like 12 second interaction. We need to understand it fully. First of all, there is a Google Doc. Well, Google.com, I think many of us are familiar with, right? So when we start typing in here, right, we can see what happens. So what is this? These few first gazes, what are they? What are people doing here? Suggested? Oh, there's no suggestions here. Yes, this is orientation. People try to orient themselves to find that box. And if you think that people know that they can just go on google.com and start typing, or they can start typing right from the search box in the Chrome browser on the top, you would be surprised. Many people don't do that, right? First step, orientation. We should be quite clear about that. Then there is a, this, you know, you saw this double tap, right? Where somebody is tapping on it to get into the inbox. All right, what is here happening? So here the person starts typing. And then this big gaze, what does it represent? Skimming through results, says Tom Keen, looking for search uh, autocomplete, scanning this type ahead options, evaluation, excellent. Fantastic, right? And don't worry, I'm also paying attention to uh, uh, to YouTube chat as well. So excellent, right? What happens next? So they look at the su su um, suggestions. All right, let's keep going. What happens here? That's very important. What is going on here? Ah, Uwe is absolutely right, right? Uh, Michelangelo, excellent. Uh, Vandra, excellent. Word feeling, yes. Radu, oh, Radu, wonderful to have you here. So it's like really a family reunion. It's unbelievable, right? So yes, people are uh, the person. That person is looking at the keyboard. They do not look at the screen while typing. Now we are probably very familiar with you know typing while looking at the screen. Many people don't do that, which means if you have autocomplete but you don't display it immediately when somebody just hits the text box, there is a chance that that person will never see your beautifully crafted, elegant, well-executed, amazing, and incredible autocomplete. So when they hit the text box, you need to show something. Now, of course, you can't show such suggestions because the person hasn't typed in anything yet, right? But you might want to highlight something like frequent or whatnot. I mean, you're probably not Google, right? But even on Google, right? Whenever you actually start, whenever you enter the page here on the first character already, there is a, kind of the first suggestions coming up. That seems like weird. Like you don't know what your person is going to type because people might not expect it all to complete to appear there, right? As we keep going, eventually, eventually that person is done and it takes them quite a while, right? They're typing in like a lot of things before they actually realize that there is, that there are suggestions that they could be using. And then, they actually start interacting with it and they click and off they go to search results, right? So that's very straightforward, but that's important for us to realize. Then the things on the top are almost immediately skipped, right? Pay attention now to the next two seconds of interaction. They are quite significant if you want your content to be found or you want to get a good search experience. So what happens here? Let me just maybe slowly move between the frames. So what is this? What does this represent? What is that person doing? Right? Exactly. So this is the scanning pattern that I was talking about, right? There is keyword scanning, and Roxana is writing and many others as well. So this is scanning, but it's not a random scanning, right? They're looking for things that actually confirm the hunt that they're looking at the right thing. And that's quite significant because when you start, when you start over here, you see that these titles are being you know, paid attention to quite a bit, right? But not only, and the reason I guess why they're leaving here is because it doesn't feel like it's maybe, you know, the right thing, because in the end they try to compare these two products. 
but this is here is what we know so far that doesn't feel like a comparison thing right and then they jump and they jump right here and they pay an incredible amount of attention to this what are they doing here exxon isa right they are checking the url the url is important right People don't go to random websites because to many people, it feels like whenever they start clicking on a page or on a search result, it's almost like an indic like almost like a commitment. They don't want to go to that tab and then see that it's not what they're looking for and then go back to reorient, reorient themselves again, right? They just try to be more effective. So they skip right away without even reading or scanning the entire title because they pay attention to the URL domain, right? And then they get here and they also look at the domain and then they confirm that hunch, right? By looking at the title. And then eventually, there's a lot of scanning, by the way, a lot of looking, right? And then eventually they click, right? So that's a lot of processing that happens there. But then one more final thing that is absolutely critical is that when they get on that page, not only do they have to orient themselves first, they do this. What does this represent? That's not search for key keywords. Yes, Nuria is right. They're confirming, confirming. That's very important. They want to make sure that they are on the right page, right? That's really, really significant, right? So they kind of look at the title. So your title must confirm what they actually saw in search results, right? So now this is kind of the entire journey, but that journey is not always looking like this because users don't always process search results sequentially. Very often they will be jumping off and up and down, right? And they often distribute their attention more variably across the entire page. There is a good reason for that. The reason is because we actually ended up changing search experience significantly. And this is what Kate Moran and Kemi Gore uh, from Norman Nielsen Group as well call the pinball pattern. It's like a pinball machine. Many search results pages are like pinball machines because you see some related items on the right. We see advertising on the top. You see thumbnails on the right. You see video excerpts. You see little lines of text and you see these little images and then you see news and then you see related searches and then you see all this stuff. So it often feels like people are just jumping from one place to the next, right? To orient themselves on the search results page on Google, right? It doesn't mean that it's going to look exactly the same for you. But if you also mix things up, where you have maybe a few search results and then you have images, thumbnails, maybe you have video excerpts or whatnot, right? You should be expecting pinball machine pattern rather than sequential from top to bottom. People just try to find the path. In reality, it looks then like this. There is this jump all over, right? It's not F, it's not Z, it's not anything, right? It's really this pinball pattern that is appearing quite a bit, right? And the reason for that again, is because we have sponsored results, featured snippet, people also ask organic results and whatnot. So there is a lot of attention that is distributed all across the page. But that's important. The, the attention that people spend on search is not evenly distributed. So if you look at the clicks of how they were happening in let's say 2006 and 2016, 2018, which was one of the recent studies, right? What you will find is that the position or the attention that people spent has changed. So if you look at 2006, like 50% of the clicks were going to result number one. 16% uh, were going to result number two, 6% were going to result number three, and then off it goes. So the first result, everything. If you're not in top three, you can forget about it. Maybe if you're lucky, if you're in top 10, that will be okay, right? But it really has changed now because the first result these days, well, it's a little bit dated, right? 2016, 18, right? The first result gets 30% of all clicks. Usually, 30% of all clicks. Second result, if it's relevant, of course, I mean, we need to kind of pay attention to that. The second gets more attention. Why? That's weird, isn't it? That's again on Google, right, at this point. Why would second result get more attention? Well, because of ads, absolutely excellent, right? Because it's not sponsored. So people are really good at scanning and skipping and skimming. Right, And then third result gets more attention, but then yes, it does drop off significantly over time. Which means if you are not displaying relevant content in top five results, you can forget about it. There is a very famous joke that Jerry McGowan is always saying, right? There are more people who went to Mount Everest than people who went to 10th search results page on Google, right? Nobody goes to page number 10 
just unless some really passionate and really committed people. That just doesn't happen, right? So that also means, though, that if we're looking, of course, on different kind of tasks, it will be different, right? So there are some selections above the fault and below the fault. They are changing. So if you're doing research, right, then yes, you'll be spending uh, a little bit more time below the fault, below the top three, top five, right? But if it's just fact finding or navigation, forget about it. That's just not going to happen, right? And of course, you could talk about fault and it's being important or not. Fault is not important. It's just the attention and how you guide people that's important. So if you change the search results layout in a way that actually drives people down, then people might be kind of stumbling up upon your search results. So the fault exists, but it doesn't really matter that much as long as you guide direction, right? That's quite important. This is coming from a wonderful article by Christopher Butler, who wrote this wonderful piece, very short, but very, very nice piece on the rhythm of your screen. Right? where he said that scanning is a partial attention, reading is focused attention. Screen without intentional rhythm will lose attention as it is being scanned. Length is usually not the problem. Lack of rhythm is. And I can only agree with that. You can guide people to relevance by designing it better. Right. So if you have just the list of items and the first three are relevant, you can forget about it. But if you do bring in some relevance and kind of different clustering, we will talk about it in a moment, then it can be actually much better and work much better as well, right? So again, kind of looking at it, if you look at the attention that is being spent on SERP positions, what you will find is that, you know, beyond 10, there is no universe in search after 10, after 10 search results, it just doesn't exist. So it just really goes very quickly, really, really, really down. So that's actually quite important for us to understand, right? So here's a quick summary. If you want to take a screenshot of this, this would be it, right? Users don't always explore results sequentially. Top search results get around 30% of all clicks. Top free search results get around 60% of all clicks. Results near the top have approximately, near the top five, get approximately 10 to 20% chance of a click, right? Results near the top have 80% uh, chance of being seen. That's different, right? And very often, you know, you get this scope search, like you go on Amazon and you can select where you want to search. Right? You want to search in that department or in music or in electronics and so on and so forth. Now, this is a good, useful feature, but most people just overlook it. They just start searching and then only then they realize, okay, I'm searching here, I'm searching there. A little bit difficult. We'll talk about it in a moment. right? Uh, and then, by the way, in just a minute, I will be checking the Google Doc because I know there might be some questions over here. right? So please write the questions in the Google Doc so I can answer them as well. Right. Oh, also quite significant. <laughs> I cannot emphasize enough. I know I'm sounding like a boring old person, maybe, but please, 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 for God's sake, make sure that people actually understand that they visited the search result already or not. That's important. People need to be able to navigate and see, okay, I was here, I was not here before. People really need this. This is very important. And they often need um, kind of, they often navigate autocomplete suggestions with keyboard as well. So it needs to be keyboard accessible. And it's expected that as they actually use keyboard to navigate to um, autocomplete suggestions, they also loop. So once they end, kind of reach the end of the list and they click down again on the arrow with keyboard, they go back again to the top. That's almost expected, right? And finally, and sorry for so much text on this slide, but People make an impression about all results based on top 10 results that they get for a particular query, right? So it doesn't matter what is on position number 11, which is why, dear friends, I will talk about it in a moment, right? I just don't get the pagination pattern. I just don't get it. So if you look at pagination from page one to page 720, why on earth would somebody wake up one day on Friday and realize, I want to go to page 13 today? That just doesn't happen. That doesn't make sense. Instead, we could say next page. That might be, there might be a need for that. Maybe you want to enable people to filter better and sort better. That would be much more efficient and much more useful than having pagination, right? This research, by the way, uh, is coming from different articles and different research that was done by Norman Nielsen Group and also Baymart Institute. So this is really valuable kind of insight, valuable insight that we can actually rely upon, right? All right, everybody's still with me? Maybe drop off of 500 people, maybe? Not not yet. Oh, by the way, it's wonderful to see Tsetanka here as well. Wow, this is like really a reunion. We could have like a little party. Um, that would be fun, right? Okay, let me just jump out. 
and see what we have here as a question, right? Uh, Lydia, we will get into all these examples. I don't have the specific data about uh, e-commerce, but Baymart definitely provides a lot of insights about that. We talked about different search topics, context, symptoms. Uh, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on that. Uh, different search topics, context, symptoms. Who would you uh, combine a search with more than one pattern? Oh, search must support everything. It, it needs to be one search box that supports it all. Um, you know, whatever is actually working for you. So if you have, let's say, a healthcare application, uh, you want people to be able to search by symptoms. You want them to be able to search by medication, medication uh, and by anything else that they have in the system installed as well. In fact, I would argue that a lot of search queries, if you look at search queries logs, will be very much related to customer support inquiries. That's actually very common that people use search box to actually search for whatever customer support provides, right? How does metadata become problem in search function? Oh, well, if you have poor metadata, your search is not going to work. It doesn't matter what engine you have. That's it. So before you even start dealing with search uh, engine, you need to understand, of course, how it works and how it prioritizes things. But it's really significant and really important to understand how, what kind of metadata you have and how do you organize it, right? Uh, search patterns on mobile, I don't have that. Right. What eye tracking software I'm using? This was again a case study, an eye tracking study from Norman Nielsen Group. I didn't use it my, on my own. Do the shared stats apply to e-commerce search as well as related to Google? Now, what you have seen so far is Google, but Baymart research confirms that. So, in that way, it's actually kind of reliable. Other questions are fantastic. We'll dive into them as time passes by. I just don't want to lose too much time on this. Let's keep going. We'll have a little break in 30 minutes, 25, 30 minutes, because now comes the interesting part, right? The interesting part is what do we do with all of that? Like, okay, so this is how people are searching. Fantastic. So how can we actually make or design a good search box? First guideline, and I feel really too simplistic or even stupid to saying that, please, please, for God's sake, do not hide the search box. Please do not hide the search box if it matters. It is important that people actually see that there is a search box. You might say, oh, come on, give me a break. It doesn't matter. Search icon, who doesn't, I mean, who doesn't understand the search icon at this point? That's not an issue. People understand search icon, but they might not come up with an idea to search if there is a search icon alone, right? What you can't tell for certain, though, when you display a search box, people will be searching more. But if you have a very bad search experience, maybe you don't want that. Right, because you will have more searches when people when you actually show the search box immediately. Let me give you an example. Now, this is coming from a wonderful session that Hikro Bleski has given a couple of years ago now, when he was speaking about this simple use case. Right, this is freepeople.com, just one of the online shops, not nothing fancy. Right, you come to the website, and as it's you know as it's as it is in 2024, you get this wonderful experience of an install app prompt and a newsletter promo and nothing else. Because why would you want to see anything else? That's all you need in life, right? You don't want to get like, you want to buy something, but this is what you get. So, all right. Uh, well, then in that case, what do we do with it? Well, we can choose to close the first one and then the other one, and then we get this. Okay, that's content here. So we get icon-based navigation. We have a feature and we have category links. Okay, well, that's e-commerce, right? Oh, okay, so um, fine, right? Excellent, right? But can we do it better? Well, maybe we can, because if you look at data, if you look at some statistics and some studies, you'll find that if you show that search box, right, you should be expecting more searches. So this is a use case from Matalan. The only thing they changed is replacing the search icon with a search box, and they had an increase of 32% of searches on mobile, right? Okay, uh, you could say that's interesting. Uh, we could try that and see if it actually helps us. So you do this, add a search bar to it. All right, what else could we do? Are there any other issues over here? Hmm, maybe, yes, because if you look at navigation, very often we're hiding navigation, critical navigation behind the Hamburg icon, right? So what if we actually showed important navigation as well? Because there is a case study, again, coming from Growth Rock, right? When you just show important navigation and you increase completed orders 5%, page views of the category pages increased by 10 to 12%. That's quite significant. There is another case study in a different vertical that they had, just hamburger icon, 
added additionally to Hamburg Icon, they added this key navigation. 29% increase in completed orders, page views of the category pages increased by 25 to 77%, quite significant. Here's another one from Edgar's, right? Show navigation, right? Prominently like this, right? It seems like it's a very old and uncool thing to do, show that navigation. 13% increase in revenue per visitor from an 11% increase on mobile conversion rate, right? So we could say here, mm, what if we just for, just for a couple of hours, on Saturday, when there is less traffic, what if we remove or replace that feature on the top with navigation? Or maybe just remove it. What would happen? Or maybe because all of a sudden now we actually see popular products at the bottom, maybe we want to show more products. Oh, maybe we actually want to show them first, right? Because it's also kind of natural to how people are interacting with the navigation. Now, this looks much better to me. Right? You see the pro guess what? You go on an e-commerce website and you see products on a homepage? That seems to be almost magical. That's surprising, right? So we get these products, we get some navigation, and what do we do next? Well, you could say, well, it's also important that we actually highlight some things like free shipping. Well, maybe there is a right place and the right time to show that free shipping, right? Maybe we could do something like this. So what you do as a result of this is you increase your searches on mobile. So this is an example that we had, right? For smashing, when we did a redesign, the same story, we had just the search icon. And then we said, let's just try to do the follow along. And we prioritize navigation and all of that. And let's just show that search box at all times, both on mobile and on desktop, right? And we're going to have also a little cat, because why not, when you want to close the menu, right? So this is what happened when we actually launched. This is the data that came from the day when we actually launched. You can probably spot the date. It was happening on May 8th, when searches increased by 40% on mobile and on desktop. If you show your search box, you should be expecting more searches happening on your page. This is just almost every single case study will actually show you something similar, right? So if you trust your search, if you want people to use a search, you probably want to search a search box at all times, both on mobile, and on desktop. That also demands, of course, to have a conversation about search box width. If you display it, how big should it be? Well, on desktop, you can probably afford having like 60%, uh, 60 characters or so, right? And probably you can afford something like 45 characters on mobile, even if it pushes down the content a little. If search is important, you might want to highlight it. And of course, you also need to keep in mind this SEO stuff around title length, which is less than 60 characters, and a good description, less than 160 characters. Nothing surprising but I think quite significant over here. That's number one, show your search box. Number two, be very careful about what you're displaying. Remember, when people are looking at search results, right, at search results, they're making an impression about what you have to offer, usually on the first page. That is quite important. And very often they will not even look beyond number five. So you need to make sure that you show relevant categories or even results with thumbnails and details. Here are a couple of examples. This is Lloyd's Bank. And on Lloyd's Bank, you have your search, right? And you have your menu. It's, it's a nice menu. It's relatively really complicated, but it's kind of looking nice. And then you have your search. And you start typing, and you get your suggestions. OK. And then you choose one of the options, like I say mortgage. And then you get this. Now you get three products right here, mortgages, mortgages, different kind of mortgages, FAQs, events, right? and so on and so forth. We can speak about FAQs later. It's a separate story. You can also upgrade and downgrade um, help articles and so on. And on the top, you get these tabs, right? Very helpful, very, very useful. You show a wide diversity of different products. Because again, if you were displaying only the same thing, right, or very similar things, that would actually cause trouble. Plus, they do one little thing which is really helpful. They kind of use this cards pattern instead of just regular search results. For a simple reason, because normally if you just use a list, like, like a list of links coming from top to bottom, you probably will end up with showing maybe one or maybe two, right? At most, two links at a time. Here you actually show three results, or if you're lucky, if somebody has a slightly large screen, maybe you can even show six results at a time. Plus, this clustering is actually quite important. I don't see many websites doing that. Right, This clustering in different types of things that they have also is kind of giving people an information sent about what the website has to offer. I can't say that cards, you know, Tony, a good question. I don't know if cards perform better than the other. 
right? And you, you might not need the icons here either, right? But you actually at least show a diversity of different results right here. Here's another example. This is a Technical University of Munich, right? And this is a relatively large website. The search is here at the bottom, right? You type in AI and you get this, right? And you get 37 pages to go through, but all of them are news, all of them, right? So again, if you actually start typing here, all of them are news. So I wouldn't be surprised that people would be expecting once they actually tap through maybe to page number two, that this is just a news search. It isn't, it is not. You can actually open the filters for search here, right here, and you can choose other things. It just, there are not that many because most of them are news, right? But if you were looking for study courses, good luck with that. I'm not sure if you would actually recognize it immediately, right? So the, again, the diversity is very important because here you would be expecting probably a new search, right? Which it isn't, right? This brings us to another point because again, we kind of, kind of need to present different things and present them as clusters. And this is called search results clustering, especially important for expert users who need to be able to cluster or look at information, look at search results through different lenses. It could be topics, categories, tabs, panels, presets, filters, whatever, right? They need complex search results. This is Financial Times, for example, right? And on Financial Times, you have your search. And when you start typing, you kind of get your different suggestions for news and securities, right? And then as you do search, you get a lot of diversity right here. Related topics, related special reports. Then you also get these topics relevant to this search on the right. You can sort by relevance and date. And as you keep going down here, right, related pages as well, you get these results. Then you get slightly differently looking live events and videos and documents and whatnot. And I think it's actually quite helpful. Remember that pattern that I was displaying, that spotting pattern where people actually pay attention to small things, right, or layer cake pattern. Well, those things right here, these little helpers, FT schools, COP28, moral money, and so on, they might be able to guide people through those things so they don't skip them, right? Quite cool, I would say. And you also show very different things neatly put together in a relatively tiny space, right? I mean, of course, as a result of that, you get to the point where you don't show any results on, you know, above the fold, if you like. Maybe it could be collapsible or anything like that, but that's a good direction to explore. Right, that's quite kind of neat. One of my favorite websites ever. Anybody from Switzerland here? Mm, yes, David, of course. Of course, David goes on to type in the chat that he is from Switzerland. Yes, I know you are. So admin.ch, a wonderful website for government uh, websites in uh, in Switzerland. Kind of the same story. It's very similar to what Google does, right? Where you have, you have these different tabs, but they allow people who need this kind of uh, content to guide, to kind of look at it with different lenses, right? Um, here's another example of world in data, kind of the same story. We have a lot of data, a lot of content, a lot of stuff, right? So you type in climate and then you get your top results. And this is great. I wish it was done more. Not only do you get suggestions, which at this point could be just keyword suggestions. No, you get different areas, topic, article, chart, explorer right? It might be not just a little bit difficult to know, to see, because it's a little bit further away on the right, but that's nice. So you kind of get this diversity of topic right here as well. And this is clustering again. And then if you dive in into results, right, you see a lot of different stuff, different lenses again, right? Research and writing, data explorers, charts, and anything else. You can see them as filters, right? That's actually very nice. Uh, I would love to see more of this, right? Here's a final example of that as well. This is Arduino, also cards. And then they have pages, store, blog, documentation, forum, project hub, which are all kind of, again, displaying this diversity of different results right there. All right. Um, nothing too fancy, but that's right. This is pretty much how it should be, right? Um, this is if you want people to actually explore the diversity of different topics you have to pro you're providing, you probably want to kind of support that. And it's also really done in this almost like a magazine style kind of look, right? Looking very cool. Right, let's keep going, right? Because it's not you know everything you can do. Casper is wondering those different types of documents is differentiating them with a the label enough? Good point. Maybe not. That's ultimately what you probably would want to test, right? I, I can't tell for sure. We haven't tested it specifically, 
but you might want to explore this direction for sure. One other thing that I think is actually quite significant, and sorry for such a fast pace over here, but we have just what, only one and a half, one hour left. And by the way, after that, I'll be here for another hour to answer all your questions. So if you have any questions, uh, you can just come in one hour and just hang out. Right? And we'll drink tea and I don't know what else. Uh, whatever you prefer. Uh, eat carrots and tomatoes, bananas. I like bananas. We can have conversations about bananas. Right. What we also need to do is to make sure that people actually get to the right place. Very often what happens is people search and they search very broad queries. And they get results, but they don't know how to proceed from there because they want to get to a particular relevant selection. They don't want to get to just random selection. They want to get to a relevant selection, right? And they might struggle to find the right filters to drive them there. Maybe they just don't know how to filter properly for what for their needs, right? So this can become a problem. So we can help them by nudging them towards scopes, right? Suggesting relevant filters, text, categories, and types of results. Here's an example of that. This is Wayfair. Wayfair, we have washing that we're typing on the top, washing machine, front load. And then you get somewhere, right? You can also type like eight kilogram, nothing happens. So you type, you click on front load and you get here. Then they ask me if you're in Germany or not, right? And then of course, it kind of allows you to search within that category right here. Now, usually this is a little bit problematic because you actually end up with two different search boxes right? But at least what they're trying to achieve here is that you're actually searching within a particular category, right? So that's better than just searching like really, really broadly, but you can fix it even better. Because if you look at all these patterns, what you have is you start typing and then you get suggestions. And then you can actually suggest to search in a particular category right from your autocomplete. Also, of course, you could do this like they do on Amazon, right? I saw some problems with that because very often people just don't realize where they're actually searching, right? So, yeah. And also, of course, as you kind of jump to a particular category, some websites just default to that category for search. Some people miss that as well. Can be a little bit difficult. If anything, if you want to go with this pattern, like with this autocomplete, that's fine. That's nice, actually. That works. That might be working. Maybe I would experiment, just experiment to have this selector on the right next to the search button rather than on, on the left. Just, just a test because I'm not quite sure if everybody would get it. Not everybody is Amazon, right? So that's uh, quite important for us here. So I would probably choose this instead, right? You have your text box, then you can select where you want to search. The default is all categories and then off you go and search, right? At least for testing again, right? So that could be quite helpful. And then again, coming back to our, our world in data, right? You basically still get to search right within particular category as well so if you i think it was somewhere at the bottom if i'm not mistaken or somewhere else i'm not quite sure when you start typing in here i don't remember now anymore to be honest uh, let's go into energy and then you go into data explorer then you're of course searching within it oh that's that's a lot of stuff over here but i think that actually we're using something similar on the top as well uh, for that Remember our beloved friend, let me just escape here. Oh, a lot of questions, fantastic. If you look at Eurolex right here, right? And we look at this search, it says quick search and then we have a search button. What I would love to turn it into would look a little bit more like this. This is a wonderful uh, mock-up by Gurmina who was, uh, was working with us on a little workshop um, that I was conducting in Ukraine. And that's, you have your search box and then you can select authors, languages, years, whatever is relevant, right? Those filters don't have to be hidden somewhere. They can be visible right away. It's just, you know, the color contrast could be a little bit better here, right? That's a little bit of an issue. But these filters, important filters, highlight, show those filters right away, right? Here's another example. This is New York Public Library. You start typing in here. You get to Marie Curie. You can view the person if you like, right here. Okay, and then get all kind of resources for that as well. Oh, that's a good point, Ignaz, about the filtering and and or. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. And then if you go back to the homepage here, 
right? You kind of get to this view and then you get to this big search box, right? And then you start typing and this all selector is all the way on the right, right? So I think that many people will not even notice it, but then you get this wonderful things like the change between the different views, the least view, the grid view, those kind of things, which is quite helpful, of course, as well. And then as you keep going, right? This is where you kind of get to, I'm not sure why I missed it, why I put it over here. This is where you kind of get to dive in in a specific part right from search results. I kind of like that. When I saw it for the first time, something changed in me. Because if you look at most search engines, they are search engines that provide merely keywords. Kind of you type in Marie Curie and you get you know, suggestions for Marie Curie. But here you can jump right away for all information that has been collected as a hub about Marie Curie. So that's helpful. So you jump in there and there is everything right here. It's an alternative view if you like, right? That's actually pretty neat. So with this, you know, you know, what we could do at this point is just allow people to search within those, um, um, to search within a particular category, right? Here's maybe a final example of that in action here, which is a Boston Public Library, right? Which is, by the way, fantastic. I mean, I can just go to this website every Saturday. I just like it so much. It's really nice. It has these different views on how you would present your results. It you can also pin your filters if you like, although it doesn't always work for some reason. Not quite sure why, right? You can also customize your results, right? It has all these wonderful little things, but important filters are always visible on the top, right? Which I think is actually very helpful, right? Just every now and then, this loading behavior is a little bit weird and this and that, right? But you pretty much have a lot of stuff happening and displaying right there. Library websites are fantastic, but we can do more than this. And one thing I would love to see on more websites around the world is scroll bar range intervals, right? Because when people are searching and when they're filtering and when they're sorting, very often they end up with just a lot of results. That's again an example of Ikea, where we have, doesn't matter what you type, doesn't matter what category you go, doesn't matter if you're sorting or not. You just have literally hundreds and maybe even thousands of results. That's an issue because if people have so many results, they get lost, right? So what if we change that, right? What if we, if we have a situation where people have a lot of results, why don't we allow them to actually navigate it more comfortably? If they're sorting by something that's quantifiable, what if we surface it right there? So if people are sorting by price, let's say, right? Wouldn't it be reasonable to just map the pricing next to the scroll bar? So if it's a say a loading, like something like an infinite scroll, right? They could jump immediately to the right value, maybe to the right page of its pagination. It doesn't matter, so something like that. That's infinitely more useful than just showing, you know, 50 or 60 different pages. So making sorting a bit more useful. You could do the same with pagination. This is an example that was used by IKEA in 2014. I remember this day. I mean, I don't remember this day, but I remember that year, 2014, right? Because I saw this on Ikea and I, I had had this realization, this is how it should be. And then they removed it probably like a month later. That was a very disappointing experience of my life as well, right? But if you use pagination, maybe that's a little bit more useful to actually indicate at least what to expect on page four or five. Is it clear? Maybe it could be improved, right? But that's infinitely more useful than just displaying a pagination as is. So if I had a choice, I would always use the steps pagination. So you would have something like a previous step, next step, if you need to use this pagination, at least indicate what people should be expecting there. If it's a hotel search, maybe we could do something like this, right, instead. It's not that difficult to do. It really is not a big deal, right? So that could be quite helpful. And finally, before the break, the final pattern that I want to really highlight because it's probably one of the most impactful ones is navigation queries. And navigation queries is a simple alternative to navigation and search, right? Because very often what happens is we get the search results, but it's not what people need. They kind of need to be more explorative or kind of really explore the interface rather than just getting search results. And what I mean by that is we might need to guide them better so a couple of years ago, I saw this example, which is from Common Bond. So you go on a, on a page and then you have this, oh, what do you want to do here? I want to refinance my student loans. Oh, uh, I want to learn about work benefits. What do you want to do? Uh, I want to borrow for school. Okay, for what? Uh, MBA, where? BYU, go. That's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. 
that's really, really fast. You don't have to use search. You don't have to use navigation. Just go where you want to go, right? Of course, as Ignaz is saying, it needs to be, you know, you need to make sure that people understand that it's clickable, but it's fantastic. Then you start going around and there are many websites doing something similar. This is the city of Düsseldorf in Germany. And they ask you in German, uh, what do you would like to do? Uh, make an appointment. Okay, for what? Uh, for consult consultation. Okay, here we go. That's fantastic. I would love to see more websites doing that. My favorite example is AO.com, right? Which is incredible. If you just think about the, the efficiency of this pattern, that's unbelievable. So you come to this page, you haven't typed anything anywhere. And you might want to buy, let's say, a washing machine or so, right? So on the front page, they give you what you need, namely, choose what you want to buy here, right? So what do you want to buy? A uh, washing machine. Okay, uh, what kind? Uh, front loader. All right, uh, how big should it be? Uh, big, right? You define your pricing range, pricing range. 25 relevant products are being displayed within 12 seconds. Try that with filters, search, categories, and everything else, right? That's fantastic. And I mean, Caroline is saying conversational style. It, it's not really conversational style. I would say it's just a chained dropdowns. I find it really, really nice because if you think about the time people need to complete a task, like finding relevant, and that's important, finding relevant washing machines, right? 12 seconds is unbeatable. It is unbeatable. You define four filters without defining them properly, right? In a search results page. So you don't have to search. You don't have to go then to category page. You don't have to go then to search results page, right? I think that this is actually quite impactful and it can be used in many different cases. This is understood.com, which just kind of highlights very different things for parents, educators, behavior uh, around different topics like behavior, distractions, uh, neurodiversity and so on, right? And so you get this, which is pretty much also quite prominent, right? How can we help? Well, I'm an educator and I want to do this, 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 and this. I'm not sure about this all the way on the right, right? But I kind of like this. It's kind of almost like a customization at this point. Show things that are relevant to me. And so here we go. These are your matches, right? A lot of examples like that in place. Of course, you could also do this to something like uh, something like uh, onboarding, like monday.com, for example, does it, right? And so in its simplest form, it could be like this. Before people even start searching or getting to search, uh, search results pages, right? We can say, hey, what do you want to do? Like I'm working with my wonderful colleagues with the European Parliament, right? And so this is kind of one of the ideas to explore, right? Where we say, okay, what do you want to do? I want to contact an MEP or follow the plenary or request documents. All right, and once you selected that, maybe you could specify what MEP you're interested in or what meeting notes are you looking for, right? And you kind of keep going from there. Same goes, I want to visit the European Parliament. Okay, where? Brussels, Strasbourg, anywhere else, Luxembourg, right? And you kind of get from there. And the final point that I want to take up making around this, right, when we're looking at these patterns, they're all just examples, right, of all the things, some of them might work, some of them might not work, right? But what is often misunderstood is that search, good search doesn't happen by accident. It just doesn't happen. It has to be actively managed and it heavily depends on the quality of metadata, right? So one thing I would always encourage anybody who is really taking search seriously to do is, Hire somebody who will take care of search, who will actively manage search, who will track the quality of search over time, who will track what people are searching for, if they are actually finding what they're looking for. If you take your search seriously, you need to have somebody who is actively managing search. And this is kind of somebody who has a tutorial background and probably also technical background, right? Because they will need to deal with a lot of metadata and things like that. And we should be measuring content fundability. For the European Parliament, for example, what we ended up doing is we're tracking the search quality score as a KPI, as a major KPI for the project. And we do this by simply checking, okay, what is the top 100 search results, oh, sorry, sorry, search queries that came our way last year? And then we go with those search results, sorry, search queries, we go to editorial team and we ask, can you give us a list of like two free URLs that should appear when people are searching for this? What do you think should be appearing there? So they give us a list. And then we're mapping what they have given us, editorially curated, and what is currently appearing in search results, right? And we do the match. And this gives us a quality score. And of course, this top three or top four results that we're getting from editorial, they must appear within top five on the search engine. 
right? Because people don't go beyond that. We learned that already. So that gives us a score about how good our search is. And this gives us a way to kind of improve it over time, right? Halfway through everyone, how are we feeling? Did you drink water? It's very important, dear friends in the chat. I would like you in the YouTube chat, please make sure that you drink water. Water is very, very important. All right. I know that some of you might need to leave or so. Um, obviously, I'm, there is the second part of this, which is coming in uh, one hour. Oh, sorry, which is coming next right away, which is going to take one hour. And then I'm going to take all the questions that you have, right? Uh, just something I wanted to mention at this point, while I have you all here, uh, there is a Google Doc. You'll find a lot of, sorry, not this one. <laughs> Funny. Uh, there is this Google Doc. Oh, no, my access has expired. No, I have it now. Uh, where you'll find a lot of stuff already. Uh, we also put together a little coupon code for you. So I put together this video course on smart interface design patterns where you'll find stuff around search, pagination, filters, and stuff like that. So if you or your team or your colleagues are interested, you get a friendly 20% off uh, in the next couple of days, if you use the code search when you're signing up here, we tried very hard to keep the pricing very friendly and accessible and affordable anyway, right? But you'll find uh, 10 hours of content and every year I update five, I add five more sessions, approximately like three more hours uh, to that. And you pay once and you get it forever, right? Just saying, just saying. And you also find all the slides of this presentation as well. All right, I suggest we have a short break of seven minutes. Seven is a lucky number seven minutes and then let's come back refreshed with water and everything uh, the big timer is is not working for me that's disappointing well okay it does work so let's come back in seven minutes everyone i'm going to check all the questions and please don't run away we'll have a lot of fun because we have to talk about filtering and sorting and autocomplete next see you in a bit everyone Maybe also playing some music because why not? Right. Let me check here. Oh, I think it will be blocked on YouTube if we play some music. Oh, I don't think I can. Mm, I don't think I can. I don't want uh, the uh, YouTube to go down. I'm afraid. But we can think by ourselves with that day. What do you mean? 
we can sing by ourselves. Oh yes, that is true. That is true. All right. So I'm just going to drink some water as well. That's uh, a good advice. I was I told heard. I'll be back in four minutes, everyone. Yeah, meanwhile, I see that there are some networking in uh, our chat in Zoom. So I think it's a very good idea we can participate. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean? I just couldn't hear you, Anastasia. Yeah, I see the people are sharing uh, their contacts uh, a little oh, bit nice. in the Zoom chat. That's wonderful. Fantastic. And it's so nice of you to actually join me in this adventure. It's so wonderful to have uh, so many people here, incredibly passionate people who care about search of all things. Isa, why are you, why do you care about search, if I may ask? Okay, you don't have to answer, but you could. Hello, Isabella, wonderful to see you here as well. But I oh, why? This is so impressive. Uh, yes, I think, Isa, because you are on my screen. So yes, that's you. All right. Fun. Good times, good times. Oh, and it's only 30 seconds. Oh, wow, that this time is passing by quickly. This is uh, unexpected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can I still share the screen? load right here but excellent so we are back just for uh your wonderful kindness of actually sticking around i want to show you and give you something entirely different entirely different that's just something that i haven't released yet um but i hope that you might find it useful as well because some of the projects that i'm involved with they relate to ux strategy and uh, using ux strategy so that's kind of a journey that i've been taking to try to would I put it best to try to not forget anything that's relevant so it's not released yet and I'm still work in progress right here but hopefully you will find it useful as well let's see if we can actually break uh, uh maybe you could also um Tatiana uh, I want to see maybe you could also share it with on YouTube as well so let's see if we can actually break fig jam I'm curious probably not 
right? But feel free to upload, to download it and copy it if you like. This is pretty much sort of a canvas which was inspired by Dan Moll's um, Canvas for Design Systems, which includes a lot of stuff. All the Oh my God, there's a lot of pointers. It includes a lot of stuff that, uh, sorry, I'm probably going to disappear from this. Uh, it includes a lot of stuff um, that you won't want to ask uh, when you're dealing with strategy. So this would require things like, uh, mapping an uh, influence map for when dealing with stakeholders and how to get information from stakeholders and some email templates to use and things like that. Uh, one of the important parts that we are doing is also risk management and prioritization right here. And then another one is event storming. We do this usually in our workshops and trainings and stuff like that to understand the scope. And I think that we also have some wonderful people at Sutanka here as well, who has very familiar with this, I would say. So this is kind of like a little, and also the one, the template for design keepers. You don't have to copy paste it. You can just duplicate it and use it forever. That's uh, that's not a problem. So that's a separate story, but I just wanted to uh, give you, if you have any feedback on that, uh, I'd be happy to explore that as well. Uh, where is the link? I'm going to jump in and paste the link one more time, heading right here. So hopefully you can jump into this, right? So hopefully you will be able to use it. Feel free to use it in any way that you like. That's a little bit off topic, but hopefully you will find it useful. Right, moving along, right? And don't worry, I'll jump into your questions in uh, approximately like 45, 50 minutes from now. I just want to make sure that we actually cover a lot of the ground. So dear friends, now that you're all back, uh, what we've done so far, we looked into how people search. We also looked into some of the design patterns for search, but I want to kind of dive even deeper now into things like autocomplete and filtering and sourcing, because in, in the end, filters, sorting, autocomplete, they all sort of belong together. They're often seen as the same thing, as the same, part of the same experience. So we probably want to explore that. We already explored though, that autocomplete can be tricky. Like if you don't indicate at all that there is autocomplete, you should not be expecting people to, um, to kind of know that there is one. We often assume that autocomplete is just a shortcut for typing, full stop, and that's it, which is not necessarily true. It has many other functions too. So if you show, if you use autocomplete, but you show the wrong things, or you just don't really help people, don't guide them to where they want to be, where they want to get, then you might even mislead people in the wrong direction. It's if it's useful, it reassures people that it actually has, that you actually have what they're actually looking for. And also often provides guidance towards better search queries. And also of course prevents misspelling and things like that, right? So autocomplete is very, very important. It's very useful beyond just keyword suggestions, right? And I think it's worth mentioning at this point. I mean, let me just escape for a moment here. It's worth mentioning that, that autocomplete doesn't have to be just for keywords. So if you go to the city of Amsterdam website, right here, just a city of Amsterdam on that website, nothing groundbreaking. Anybody from the Netherlands, kudos to you. I love the city of Amsterdam website as well, right? So you have search over here. And when you start typing, let's say uh, security, right? What you get here is not keyword suggestions. No, you get jumps and links directly to specific pages or sections. So why do we even have search keywords suggestions, if we can actually do that. Maybe we need both actually. I wouldn't say that we need only one or the other, right? But I like this, I really do. Instead of actually saying, okay, I'm, I'm looking for education and then show me everything around education. Then you can say, okay, I'm looking for the topic education or policy education or bilingual education or compulsory education or policy cultural education. And I wish you could also open this little drop down over there and see more but you kind of get to specific pages. It's kind of more of a autocomplete for different categories rather than just keywords. And that's quite a distinction. So autocomplete can come in different flavors, keyword suggestions, category suggestions, product suggestions, history search suggestions, mix of all everything and so on. Also another thing that we've seen in the world of data is filters suggestions, right? And I would love to see that more, right? When you maybe start typing and you can say, oh, uh, I want to search for this topic, Mm -hmm. But I also want to adapt or use this filter because it's suggested to me. We could do way more with autocomplete for sure. But if you have just this as a text box, you should not be expecting people to know that when they actually start interacting with it, that they understand and they expect autocomplete. Maybe they expect in some scenarios, but we shouldn't rely on that. You just never know for sure. 
And of course, again, it's worth mentioning at this point that autocomplete has needs a lot of attention, which is why I said that it needs to be actively managed. So if I look at something like this, which happens every now and again, you start typing G and you get this. Why? Is it really broken search? Is it like really broken autocomplete? Or is it just broken waiting of results or suggestions, kind of showing, all right, I'm going to show everything that has a letter G, right? That could be like wrong setting or whatnot, right? Sometimes it's really rare that this happens, but sometimes it happens, right? Or if you do this, right? You know, what should be appearing there? There must be some logic behind the scene that actually takes care of that, right? Obviously, like making sure that the first character that you're typing are right, but then it's not very trivial. Because if you're living in, in Netherlands, right, it could be that you might be typing or somebody might be typing Holland, the Netherlands, Netherlands, NL, you have to support all of that. So it's not getting, it's not getting really, really easy with that. So we kind of have to keep that in mind. So as Adam Silver wrote in his book, Inform Design Patterns, without an icon, or the complete boxes might look like a regular text box. With an arrow next to it, they look like a select dropdown. Plus, people who look at the keyboard when they type may not spot the suggestions. So your, your, select, your autocomplete might want to look like this. That might be already even better, though it of course looks like a dropdown. Or you might want to have sort of a search icon instead. But if you have autocomplete, you might want to indicate that there is autocomplete, right? And of course, whenever you start typing, you probably want to highlight it uh, in some way as well. So when you actually start, you actually show something immediately right even if there's somebody clears it and so you need a clear button right so that's a little bit of an issue over here and then whenever you type in de you should also see germany appearing right so you need to support abbreviations and it's not that straightforward right so there is a lot of stuff to consider so let's break it down step by step one thing we've seen already show suggestions on focus it could be frequently used most popular history followed by an alphabetical list right here's an example of that so you basically start typing your country and then, you know, if it's a B2B system, let's say you can say, okay, well, most of our clients are from those countries. So we're going to highlight them in the top as frequently used, but you also need to follow along with alphabetical list, which contains also these four countries that we have on the top. Some people will scroll too fast to realize that there are these frequently used options on the top. So you might want to repeat United Kingdom, USA, Germany, and Netherlands in the alphabetical list as well, right? And of course, we probably don't want to do this. Well, that's for sure, right? Um, because again, you end up with all kinds of situations where somebody's looking for Netherlands, they might be on the top because it's a kind of a prioritized country or somewhere in the middle because it's Netherlands or all the way in the bottom because it's the Netherlands. So you can get very quickly, very messy. So I have for every single thing that kind of relates to autocomplete, my own autocomplete profiling, as we call it. And the way it looks is usually like this. So if I have a country selector, which is going to be auto-completed, well, we need to have a very clear understanding about what the implementation or what the interaction experience is going to be. So it is a required input. We accept browser's autofill. It's autocomplete. It's also autocorrect or not. Again, I'm not saying that you always have to do this, but you might want to consider autocorrection at some point or suggest at least people to autocorrect um, or correct the entry. Um, do we support manual input? So if somebody types in Catalonia, what do we do with that? Do we accept it? Do we support it? Do we throw an error? Those kind of things are important to consider. We also list frequently used countries. We also list alphabetical list of countries. And then we also have a fixed height of 7.5 cells. What the hell is this? So you start typing and you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and a half suggestions. Or oh, at this point, it just doesn't fit. Six and a half suggestions. And it's important that it's not, you know, cut, that it's kind of cut off. Because otherwise, some people might not know that there is more if they start scrolling. Because the scroll button doesn't always appear on all um, individual systems, right? And that's not it. You have more. But do we want to use detection by IP? Do we want to use, again, manual input or selection? Input, should it be alphabetical in spaces? Do we support that? Do we show drop down on focus? Do we accept abbreviations? Do we need any validation? Do we need to change automatically to zip code when people are selecting a country? And then of course the country will change, will impact UI as well. So there are a lot of dependencies and you might wonder, and if of course, if I ask you, 
what changes will be impacted by a country selection? Well, 24 of them. Currency labels, spelling, formatting, measuring, units, times, dates, zip code, postal codes, and whatnot, right? So for every single thing that relates to searches in terms of autocomplete, we'll have, we'll have to sit down with an engineer or whoever is going to implement our search and talk through those things. It's not a big discussion. It's like one hour discussion, but I do not want to forget anything important. So that gives me peace, inner peace, so I will be speaking through all of those things to make sure that we're actually very much aligned, right? That's a very significant part uh, in my case. Make sense, everyone? All good? Still alive? Excellent. Whew. Oh, that was a bad joke. I'm sorry. Um, you can also just write plus in the chat. Who doesn't like a few pluses? Okay, Greg is still in the house. Makes me very happy. Thank you so much, Greg. And everybody else as well. Oh, Kyle Labyrinth is here. That's nice. And Mike is here. Oh my God, this is really a reunion. Mike, two greetings to you. Here we go. All right. One other thing that is important, again, it's very similar to what we saw in search previously. We want to show diverse results in autocomplete as well. Not only search results pages, but also when we actually displaying autocomplete suggestions. Now, a simple and almost stupid example is IMDB. You start typing something. I don't remember what I have typed because I don't see it because of Zoom, right? I think it's... I don't remember what it is, HIT or something. Yes, HIT, I guess, right? So you kind of get different suggestions. So in order complete. Thank you so much, Job, as well, right? So that's kind of cool. And that represents itself across everything, like on mobile as well, of course. So whenever you're actually typing something like Bose, headphones, QC, right? Uh, you need to see category. You probably need to see previous and past searches. And you also need to see your category, your suggestions. I find it actually much better on Ikea again, when you type in vase right here and you get three keyword suggestions, two category suggestions, two product suggestions, and then the actual global search as well, right? Which is kind of cool. And then you get this one, which is Galaxy CH, again, greetings to Switzerland, coffee machine or coffee machine. And you get four suggestions for search keywords, categories, two categories, and then three products. That's fantastic. That's pretty much how it should be. And it keeps going. I mean, there is no keyboard. You're right. 40%, 45% of the screen will be covered by keyboard, right? You're totally right about this, Philip. Uh, it was just, uh, I just was too lazy to mock it up, to be honest, right? Here's another one where you get this, uh, one from Finland on the left, also categories. Uh, here, Hema from the Netherlands, where you actually show the prices for the products as well, right? And here, I believe one from Portugal or Spain, I'm not quite sure. We also get these different views. And you also can scope directly and search for a specific category, which I think is actually quite neat as well at this point, right? And not surprising, thank you so much, David, Spain. Um, not surprising, it looks exactly like this on desktop as well. So you get your product suggestions, you get the keyword suggestions, and everybody is more or less happy, right? Again, also, this is cool blue uh, in Netherlands. You also get the same story where you get prices and ratings. That's incredible. It's not just keywords. You get keywords plus advice or guidance here and top products with their reviews and pricing. And, you know, it's probably a good idea to actually highlight the previous price so it actually might sell better. That's nice, right? That's much better than just giving people keywords alone. That's actually quite helpful. But this list that you see here in front of you must be manageable because as oh, I forgot the name, somebody has mentioned, well, we have keyboard and keyboard takes away approximately 40 to 50% of the screen. So what does it leave us? Well, how much space does it leave us with? Well, maybe we can show at most eight items on mobile and something like eight to 10 items on desktop for it not to feel overwhelming, right? And you probably don't want to have a scroll bar within your area. Like it's, it's a relatively small area anyway. So you probably want to avoid that scroll bar. So that means that that space that we have, this four to eight items, they need to be scrutinized because they need to be diverse. They need to probably fit in different buckets, like categories, products, searches, keywords, right? Because this is mass, right? That's just not helpful. There is a lot of things that look very similar, maybe a little bit too similar. That's not working too well, right? And that does show up a lot on mobile, right? So if you look around at uh, Tommy Hilfiger, for example, well, I'm not quite sure what's going on here, but you have a women's shirt twice, but then women t-shirt as well. And then you have women. And so you get to a lot of stuff, which might seem like a little bit overwhelming, 
I said this also because there is a lot of overlap, right? Uh, and then you get again these success examples here. And then you get also brands and products and categories over here as well, right? Um, there are plenty of examples like that as well. Here comes the tricky part. I had no idea until I realized that it's actually a problem. What do we highlight in search results? So when somebody is searching over here, like for example, on Denmark's in statistics website, we don't highlight anything, which means whenever somebody is typing, we just basically highlight full search query, right, as a keyword. But here, for example, we are highlighting, but we're not highlighting what is a match. We're highlighting what is not a match. So instead of highlighting drum across all these keywords, we are highlighting what is not a match, very similar to what Amazon does. And that's actually a more common pattern than the other way around. Although personally, I would always do it the other way around, right? And again, if you look, for example, here, washing machines, right here, cool blue, again, I don't see what I have typed here, Boston. So what you basically get here is also not what you have typed, but the rest. So that seems to be kind of more common, actually, where you're highlighting the differences rather than actually the similarities, right? Here's another example, which is uh, from Alibaba. You type in health, and it's actually deprioritized, while the rest is prioritized, right? So this happens quite a bit, and this has almost kind of become a, a norm, which is very surprising to me, frankly. I haven't tested it personally, so I don't know which one is better or not, but this is actually more common to see this, right, than to see it the other way around. But it's missing one important bit. Right. Yes, absolutely right, Fred, a norm, but that doesn't mean that it's correct, right? You're totally right on this, right? But it's missing one important bit. We need to show the number of matches as well. Because when people are searching, they need to move to this comfortable range, as it's called. Like something that's manageable for them as a list of items. It doesn't have to be five. It could be hundreds or hundreds if you're an expert user, but it probably isn't thousands, right? So we need to show the number of matches or status within autocomplete to help people decide whether they need to proceed or whether they need to refine the search query first. Let me give you an example of that. Welcome to the magnificent website of the US Congress. There is a lot of stuff on the website. I mean, actually I do like the website. I don't mind it at all, right? There's a lot of stuff here. You can search and you can scope the search as well. That's a lot of stuff right here. And when you start searching, you kind of get these little statuses and different reports. And I have this tracker, which indicates just where we currently are for that law, right? So quite a lot of stuff going on here, right? And then you also have these options to hide some details or show some details. You can have these refinements on the top where you have your filters, right? It's all nice and neat, right? And then we also show the number of results over here. But when we get to filters, right here, you can spend an enormous, and I mean it, enormous amount of time refining your legislation or law number or actions or particularly choosing your senators or representatives or years. But every time it's a guess. Why? Well, because you select your filters and then you click on search and it's only then when you get to realize how many results there are. So you search, and then you look again. And then if, if it's too many searches again, well, then you need to refine and then you click search again. And so it gets updated all the way. 739,000 searches is a little bit too much, right? But then you have to go back to filters and you have to refine step by step and you're just guessing. This is where people waste time. That's just not necessary, not very useful. This on the other hand is Adidas. On Adidas, you get a few other things here. Again, this is where example where you type in ultra and then ultra is being highlighted right here, right? And then, is it a video? I think it was supposed to be a video. Uh, you also get these products and things like that. But you also, for each of them, get the number, how many results you should be expecting there. That's fantastic to see because this is what people need, right? Give them that in autocomplete because they actually need to be certain that they're moving in the right direction. But then there is a big disaster, the biggest disaster ever. And I mean, I don't mean it uh, this way, but it's actually quite significant. This is MediaMarkt. MediaMarkt is a big e-commerce retailer in Germany and probably all over Europe at this point. I'm going to drop it in the chat as well. 
right? And it uh, has a very nice website, very kind of strong, vivid brand, right? Lots of category stuff and, you know, we know the drill and everything. And then it has search. And so you start typing. And let's say we're typing HDMI. Okay, so we get the same story, right? We're also highlighting here what is currently selected, HDMI. And then we have the rest. And then here we have the products, right? All right, so we probably know what to expect when you click on this button. Well, we've done it thousands, thousands of times, right? You click on HDMI cable, you get HDMI cable search results. Fantastic, no big surprises here. But what is the difference between clicking over here and clicking on this arrow over here? You don't need to speak or you don't need to kind of uh, tell me what it is. Please write in the chat plus if you're absolutely certain that you know what it means and what it's going to do. Please write in the plus and please write minus if you do not. Oh, some people write it's the same, right? So in my personal experience, I'm going to just wait for a moment to check what uh, people in uh, YouTube is, are writing. Uh -huh. All right. Well, what I can tell from my experience is most people will have no idea that these are different actions. That's number one. Number two, most people will never discover this feature, which is one of the most powerful and most useful features that bring people to the right results, right? Now, here's the difference. When you start uh, typing HDMI and you have the suggestions, what the click over here will do, it will append that search query that you have over here into the search box, which is incredible. It's fantastic because you can now really comfortably navigate to the right search query. That's a very useful feature that nobody understands and knows about. I would say that in my experience, probably like 90, 95% of people have no idea that it's actually doing something different, right? And that's an issue. So that's a really useful feature, which nobody understands. So we probably want to adjust it and make it a little bit more helpful, a little bit better. How do we do that? With something like this, right? This is again, just a mock-up that Google has came up with, I think a while back, I think that they rolled it out on some pages, but not, on there, not everywhere in the world, right? So when you start typing, they get this bubble suggestions, which are different from the regular suggestions, right here. So you have food, Fox, Ford, whatever, right? These little words over here. When you tap on one of them, it gets added or appended to your search query. So that's great, right? And then you keep going, right? So that is distinct, at least it's distinct from the rest. It's not like a uh, like an icon on the right or anything of that kind because people will not understand it. This, on the other hand, seems to be working much better, right? And once you know that this is how it works by just tapping on it, you learn how it works. And that's really helpful. That really boosts people and drives them to useful results. So that's very helpful. This, unfortunately, uh, is something I would probably suggest not to use as a pattern, right? This, on the other hand, would be something I would definitely, definitely try and test, right? I find a lot of value in that, right? And also, as I was mentioning before, right? Because when we're looking at all of these examples here, it seems like it's such a small thing, but when they come together, all of them come together, that can make a big impact, like a really big impact. Another thing that's kind of relates to that, by the way, is that we, that we talked about already, is that we might want to allow people to skip search results pages. If aliens ever came to this planet, they'll be very confused why on earth we push people to go to search results pages and then click on links on those search results pages to get where they want to be. Can we just drive them directly where they want to be? Like maybe this? This is the statistics of Estonia website. Greetings to everyone who is connecting us from Estonia. I love Estonia. I'm an e-resident in Estonia, so I'm very connected to Estonia in many different ways. So you type in migrate and you just get your reports and you just get your results and you don't have to search for search queries. Just get there. That's it. This is MIT. I also give you this overview on the right and left upper corner. What are you looking for? And you have these top resources as well, right? And when you start typing over there, you have these little suggestions and stuff, right? Solar, just go right to links. You can still search if you want to see more results, but you just get your results immediately in your autocomplete suggestions. 
that's infinitely more useful than just saying, okay, uh, these are the search queries, um, go for the best one. I know that some people are connecting from Brussels, so I had to mention it as well. This is the city of Brussels website. Visually, maybe a little bit underwhelming. I would have to say maybe a little bit dated, right? But that's nice. So you have transparency that you're typing. You just get straight to your search pages without actually having to go to search results page. That's wonderful. And of course, it's also very similar in applications. When you look at Stripe, right? When you just start typing and you basically get right away to results without actually seeing all results necessarily. That's actually pretty useful and pretty helpful as well. That kind of makes sense. So to sum up everything around autocomplete, show autocomplete suggestions on focus. You need to show something, ideally. Use a drop-down icon, a search icon to hinder autocomplete. You can use this bubble type like Google is doing. Uh, type They call type ahead suggestions for appending search queries. When it comes to search box tweet, we're looking at 60 characters, a desktop 45 characters on mobile. Add autocomplete filters or scopes within search or within uh, uh, when people start typing. So you actually can drive them right away to the right category, like we saw in some of the examples. Um, you need to support keyboard navigation for results. People are moving up and down. You probably want to avoid multiple search boxes on the same page. Usually it's confusing. It's often not necessary. And the reason why we have that is because we have a simple search and then we have the advanced search. But then expert users will always go to advanced search and simple users, if you like, will always go to simple search. So you just probably want to break out from advanced search and just show filters and maybe more filters in the dedicated filters area, which we'll talk about briefly, right? And guide users to results in categories, not keywords. Finally, when, you know, if you want to measure the quality of your search, you need to measure top 100 search results and defendability. And then again, remember, relentlessly focus on the quality of top three, at most top five results, right? That's autocomplete, my friends. Uh, how are we doing today? How, 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 do, how do I answer that question? On the scale from one to 10, right? How are you feeling now? Like one being miserable, I want to change my life and move on with something and do something entirely different in my uh, career. A 10, oh, pretty good. Okay, uh, get seven, eight, nine, ten. Excellent. So I'm going to, my goal is to push you to 10 in the next 18 minutes. Let's see how far I can take it. Okay, I'm also going to check uh, what it looks like on uh, YouTube. Okay, eight, seven, nine. Okay, that uh, seems like a, we're in a good place. All right, two more things to cover. Filters, sourcing. Both very important, both a part of the experience and deserve a lot of attention. But we have like around 20 minutes for that. So let's dive in. And then don't forget, I'm going to dive into all your questions and I would love to hear you on camera as well uh, with a mic. I'm not running away. All right, filters. Please do not do this. Sorry if you're working for Dell. I don't mean it in a bad way, for sure. At this point, I also have to mention a really silly joke. Amanda will, will not appreciate it, I think. How would you call a singing computer? A Dell? Okay, that's pretty bad. Sorry about that, but I had to give it a try. It's like, it's okay if you don't get it. That's fine. I'm I'm really terrible with jokes. People run away when they hear me telling a joke. Right. So please don't do this. Here's what we do right here. We have Dell. And then in there, we have filters for processors and memory and whatnot. And this is what happens. So what exactly happened here? That's a little bit confusing. And that's not fair, right? So I'm going to just track in the chat, just going to show it one more time here. Yeah, so indeed this is a very slow filter and there is a delayed update as Laurie is writing as well. The problem is that whenever somebody clicks on a checkbox and the checkbox becomes blue, it's a promise. It's a promise that the interface tells us that it understands us, that it cares about us, that it cares about our needs, and then it betrays us. That's not fair. I didn't sign up for this, right? Because in the end, when you get to this point, when you actually select all of those things, right? 
you kind of feel like, yeah, this is going to show up and uh, yeah, and that's fine. And that's fine. And this has multiple different reasons. First of all, it could be that only the last option that's being uh, kind of ticked is selected. That could be the case, but it could also be dependent on very different things, specifically on the logic underneath. It might be the OR logic, it might be the AND logic. And that would be very different for different systems. So if I'm looking at processors over here, you could say, well, I'm looking for Intel Core i9 or Xeon or Ryzen or whatever, but the system perceives it differently. It only takes what matches all of your selections. And that's weird. Why? Because if you type in 12 gigabyte and 16 gigabyte, uh, both of them would work for me. I want to look and explore all of these options. The other reason could be, and you know, you're absolutely right at this point. Who was that? I think it was Roxanne, right? Um, you might be in a different situation where you might have selected some processors, but then these processors do not work together with seventh generation or ninth generation. So that's all because of the end logic that is embedded over here, which becomes a problem. Not to mention, of course, the issues with delay and all of that. So you need to be very careful about what kind of logic we're using there for filtering. Here's another example from Yale University Library. As you can see, I'm a big fan of university library websites as well. You have a lot of stuff going on here, right? Uh, content and stuff, and you have the content types and filters and search within filters, and it's all nice and neat. And you get these different selections right here, and then you have more selections, and they also present it with the view. But every time you click, the entire UI freezes. Everything freezes, right? And that's a problem because now what you have here in front of you, not only does it freeze, so it's blocking you from actively selecting multiple uh, different filters, it also shifts like vertically. Well, because these filters that you have selected are appearing all the way on the top and they grow from top to bottom. That creates the shifts which is where people actually hit or miss rather than filters that they wanted to hit. It's very dangerous to display your filters in the sidebar where the filters are living. I mean, selected filters. It's probably way better to display these filters above search results and not in the sidebar. We'll talk about it in a moment. And here's an example of Sears, which is again, another story altogether, right? Where you click on a filter somewhere, maybe, and then it freezes and scrolls you up to the top. So you have to go down then to continue filtering. Most people go from top to bottom as they're filtering. That's just chaos. This is just a disaster. That really is. And then your selections are not even displayed. I mean, I, that, that, I, I don't know what's going on here, right? So, and then eventually it just breaks all together. So that's a bit disappointing, right? Uh, and then here you also get the semantic scholar, by the way, when you start typing. And then you get the uh, results over here. And that I really, really like, right? It gives you a lot of information over here and it also gives you a way to actually uh, dive into more details if you wanted to, download things right away like PDFs and stuff like that. There's quite a lot of stuff that's going on here. You can expand and see more details if you want to, see less details if you want to. And then they also have these cards on the top which allow you kind of like filters, important filters. Right? You also can change the view and list view, card view, and things like that. Sorting is also quite different by most influential papers and so on. Very nice. I find it a very, very nice experience. And then also the same story when every time you're selecting one of the filters, you're kind of expecting that this is going to be applied immediately. In my experience, it's actually quite rare that people need to select exactly one filter at a time. It might be a good idea here to test at least, right? Maybe we could allow people to select many filters at a time and then click Submit, and it's only then when the results are going to be displayed. We'll see an example of that in a moment as well. But here, every time you select a filter, everything has to refresh. That's better than Dell, but it's not ideal, right? Okay, so how can we do this better then? Maybe like this. This is University of Stockholm, and here on the left, you have your filters. And you click, and you click, and you click as much as you like. You can keep clicking and enjoy your clicking experience, right? And then the results are decoupled from your filtering. So you actually get to see them, right, whenever they're loaded. But you just click. Just let people be. Let them click. This should be the new thing for 2024. Let people click. Let people be, right? More than that, they also have this search, which is a search with autocomplete suggestions for search results that are displayed within that search area. That's like double search, if you like. 
a bit, a bit complicated, but actually looking pretty good to me. Here is a similar example from the Dutch no, Royal Academy of uh, Denmark, if I'm not mistaken. So you have your wonderful filters over here, you just select whatever you want, and then eventually you say, okay, apply, and then it gets applied. But it does a little bit more than that because you might have very different and very complicated filtering as well. So here, what you also get is these different options and features and whatnot, right? And you can select some of them. Oh, but hold on, what is this? That's interesting, right? It still kind of applies it immediately, which is a little bit confusing, but they have these little icons right here. Can you see this? When I saw this, my life has changed forever. That's, uh, that's, that's mind blowing and life changing experience right here. What could this be? Well, remember this complex search I was showing with Eurolex, which is like the law, access to the big repository of law, right? Where you had this and or, and or logic. Do we need this? What if we actually have next to each filter something like this? Well, maybe we need to test the icon and stuff like that, right? So when you select it now, right here, this is like one of them and you select maybe a few more. Come on, come on, let's keep going. Just a moment, right? You also, what you end up doing is you are defining the and and the or conditions at the same time. So well, you're saying, I want this, but I don't want this. You don't need an advanced search to construct those queries. You have your filters area, and then you allow people to say, I want this and not this. You can even log these filters and then refresh, of course, as well, right? Quite sophisticated. I kind of like this a lot, I have to say. That's uh, pretty neat, right? So maybe we could do something similar to this. Yeah, there is a lot of value in that, right? Um, so we need to be very careful there when it comes to how we're presenting the logic and what logic we're using, right? And again, there are a couple of examples I, I'm probably going to skip here because of the time. But if you look, let's say, at something like New York, um, New England Journal of Medicine, and you have your filters here, very often this logic they're operating with, although it's still just a checkbox, is different than what you're expecting. It might be that you're expecting and, but what you get is or. So what you get here is and, so it's not like health policy or perspective or something else from health policy, right? You basically just get everything that matches all of those things, right? The same happens here on the Foreign Ministry of Affairs uh, in Germany. You get a search and you start searching, like for a particular topic, let's say, and then you have this filter area on the top. And these are buttons, checkboxes basically, right? But as you click for them, you don't get options from all of them. You get only those options or documents that match all of those options at the same time, which is a very different meaning, right? So what you get here is something that matches all of these four options. And eventually, as you will see, right, it's just not going to display any results, right? Or maybe just one or so. So once you get to this uh, apply, Right? You basically get to five results that kind of match all of that, which is a little bit different. Right, So you need to be kind of very careful and have a conversation with your engineers and with your team, uh, just what kind of logic we have. I'm not saying that one is always right, the other is not. Right, You just want to probably clarify it. If it's a checkbox, the assumption on e-commerce sites for sure is that it's an end. Right? But if it's like a library where you have a lot of like a law repository, maybe it's different. So you probably want to be very careful about that. And, right, as you do that, as you kind of think about this, it is significant to show filters above search results and not in the sidebar, right? It could look similar to this. There is no harm in that. This is Galaxy. So you just display this uh, filters in two lines on the top, right? And then you expand and, you know, you basically, whenever somebody is clicking on show 20 results or 30 results or whatever, it's only then when you actually update the list. So you don't have to update it all the time when somebody makes one selection, because this is usually not how people will actually operate or integrate or use that filter. That's just not the usual case. The usual case is four to six filters that are applied at a time, right? So probably want to be respectful and, and kind of support that in many ways, right? Oh, something like this could also work, right? Where you have this kind of important filters appearing right on the top, but you still have a bit of complex logic going on over here. Maybe I'm getting lost in details, but this is something you might want to do. Two more important patterns for filtering. 
highly underrated integrate filters in your search results. And what I mean by that is when people are exploring search results or your product page or whatever you have, right? You might want to have something that gives them access to actually choose something immediately. And I don't mean it like in a filter area in a sidebar somewhere, right? What I mean here is that right here in the middle, you have these different features that uh, headphones have. And right here on that level, you can say, oh, I'm interested in this. And this is the filter, then that gets applied to the entire list, not just to this product. So you navigate from there. You don't need to go to a dedicated filters area, search results area. Here's again, another example of how it could be done in a slightly more complex environment when you might want to choose some languages, right? You know, you just integrate this as a selection to be able to apply and show more languages right from here. Kind of very helpful, right? Right here at this point. So it kind of gets really complex over time. You could also, of course, use other patterns like maybe this, where you have filters living inline in data tables, right? And so when you type, you kind of everything gets filtered by that, and you can also filter by other things at the same time. Very fast, very good, right? Or you could also have this little relationship filtering, where you might have, if you have a nested tree, like imagine you have a very complex enterprise application and you have a lot of like tree with many, many, many branches and a lot of nesting. You don't need to display it like um, vertically coming from top to bottom. Instead, you can actually break it down horizontally as an overlay like this. You go into one section, from there you go into another and then from there you go into another and then from there you get to other things. Right, that could work fairly well, right? That also goes for any transitions when you want to construct your maybe your queries. Maybe something like this. This is Yahoo Finance, where you basically have uh, option to add another filter and more filters and more filters as it comes from top to bottom. And as you keep doing that, you basically end up with something that will look like this, applied to, let's say, different condition, different scenario. We want to say uh, the year is this, political group is that, procedure status is this, and you can also add another filter right there. And if somebody adds a new filter, they kind of get a view like this, maybe. Right, but they get these different reference types, maybe on the left or whatnot, and they can say, okay, for this, I want to select this and add this as a filter. And it becomes a new line on the top. And then I want to add this and then with another filter. That's really, really fast. That works really, really well, I have to say at this point, right? Finally, um, and that's a little bit funky again at this point. If I had to point you to one example, one final example of search, which is absolutely incredible. I would probably guide you to the British Museum website. That's a great search experience in many different ways. Fully accessible, good autocomplete, good search results pages, diversity of results. You can, you can do a lot of stuff. Very cool, clean, nice, performant, accessible, all the good stuff right here. I absolutely love it. I mean, there is no way, I mean, it's just incredible, right? And one thing that they also have, which I found quite interesting, and this is unusual because I've never seen it anywhere else, they have search within search. So you have your search. At this point, we are searching for, let's say, a particular thing, right? And I look at this again, like filters are always like where you just need them, right? And you can also hide them if you don't want to. So I was searching for something, but then within those results that I see on the right, I can also enter a keyword and search within search results. So it's kind of scoping, if you like. Maybe a little bit complicated, maybe it needs to be placed a bit differently, right? But I think eventually when I start searching, I can just jump a little here. Just a moment, everyone. Hold on. Do, 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 do. Do, do. Here we go, production date, here we go. So once eventually you get to enter a keyword right here, you basically end up searching within whatever it is that you already have searched. But I mean, unfortunately, it didn't bring any results, but you kind of get the idea from here, right? Interesting. For advanced stuff, good stuff, right? Uh, this is also University of Antwerp doing the same thing, which is a little bit confusing here because it might not be obvious. We have this search on the top, but that search acts actually as search within that search, within that list that we have uh, on the main page. So as you keep going and you start typing and also you have this nice grouping and clustering, which I think is actually very cool, right? But then on the top, if you actually start searching now, let me just jump there, right? All the way on the top, if you start searching, it actually filtering whatever you have uh, displayed at the, uh, the bottom of the list. So it kind of adds it as another 
option right there as a filter, right? Maybe not as obvious, it could be considered to be a global search instead. So what do we do with filters? Decouple filtering from search results, allow users to select multiple filters at a time, especially on mobile, right? This is where you want to have an overlay which says show 50 results where everybody, once you've selected all the filters, have a button saying show these results. I think I have some examples of that, by the way, just to make it very clear. Oh, here we go. I think it's worth showing them, right? So this is Walgreens on the left. Have certain filter right here. And then once you start operating it or kind of going through it, right? I mentioned you get these ads and so on. And then you click one of the filters and it escapes. So it presents you with this page because I would for some reason scroll down. Then you have to open it again. And then you select another filter and then it escapes again. Not great because most of the time, especially in e-commerce environments, people will be applying four to six filters at a time. Not great. The other pattern I just don't understand is this. Why are we doing this so much? I mean, why? Seriously. There is no reason for that. We are basically, instead of showing filters and using the space to show filters, we're blurring out some sort of details in the back to indicate to people that there is something there. And then the weirdest part is every time we're selecting a given filter here in this list, right, this blurriness gets updated, slowing down everything and kind of resetting some of the filters. What is this? Why are we doing this? There is no point of highlighting this at all. It's just not very helpful. Or another example in crash field, right, where you have your filter and it kind of opens the full menu, which is nice. But then every time you're interacting with the filter, every single time, let's have a little dance first. I don't want to dance. Let me select as many filters as I can. Why do I have to wait all the time? There is no reason for that. They don't show anything. The only thing they do is updating the count of results. And that's just not good enough in 2024, right? How do we do it better? Like this, right? Again, I showed some of those examples already, right? I'm going to just jump in here. Hold on, back. No, the video doesn't want to play for some reason. That's disappointing. That really is because it was a nice video. Okay, it doesn't want to play for some reason. Hmm, sad. Hold on, I can just escape. I think I can still show it. Yes, I hope it's still visible here. Right here, here we go. So you basically get this overview and you basically just click, 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 click. Nothing is slowing you down. There is nothing dancing. Then eventually, whenever you're done, you just say, I want to see 50 products. And then you basically show 50 products. Nice. That's how it should be, right? Or this, one of my favorite examples from India. Uh, greetings from everyone who is watching us from India, by the way. Mintra, fantastic. What they do is not only like fancy and lovely sorting and so on, right? But also we get to this point where you have these filters and they split the screen in two parts where you have the categories on the left, have the actual filters on the right. It's so fast. It's such a fast filtering experience on mobile. That's great. I mean, of course, if you have to internationalize or localize for 20 different languages, it will be difficult to get it right. But that's incredible. I wish it was everywhere. That's a very, very nice example, very nice experience in general. So between all the different options, I would say probably the one that I would prefer is either this one, if you can fit it in, but you still need to show the number of results, maybe not like this. It's a wonderful design system from Goldman Sachs, by the way, which is always a good recommendation to look at. It's a fully open source, right? But I'd probably try to say something like show 38 results or 60 results right on the button. Right, this I'm not quite sure where we display it. There must be a close button on the right upper corner. That's fine. Usually, you would need space to display all filters, or maybe this. That might be okay as well. But uh, you know, when you're there, you can also just go full screen. There is no harm in that, right? So, again, just to finish up here, right? We basically have all these options. Um, filter overlay above search results is better. Like showing filters on the top above search results is better than. Um, but potentially potentially better than having them in a the sidebar, at least I would try it. Please do not auto-collapse filter accordions in the sidebar after every selection. That's so frustrating. Um, use relationship filtering with these little panels for power users, especially for very complex filtering. Always show number of matches, like show X results on a button. Double check that users actually understand your filtering logic. On mobile, full screen. Also on mobile, we always prefer the apply button or show 50 items button or whatever. And when in doubt, always display selected filters or filters in general 
above search results. I would highly encourage you to do that. All right, so we are not quite done because I haven't gotten into sourcing, but I would like to just wrap up uh, so you can actually get the recording later to see the rest as well. Um, and I, I want to stay, so have enough time to jump into all the questions that you have, right? And so to wrap up here, there are a few things that I would probably track and keep in mind. That's it. Like these are probably the most important takeaways that I would get from this. First, users do not always explore results sequentially. Most of the time, especially if you have a lot of images and categories and stuff like that on your site, in your search results, you will be expecting a pinball pattern, people moving around quite a bit. It's not going from top to bottom. Top three results often get around 60% of all clicks in main search engines. So this is a common expectation that the relevance is to see in the first five results, at best at one on the first page, not on the second page. So relentlessly focus on the quality of top three results for your top 100 queries. If you get them right, your search will be working just fine. Search box width, we talked about this already, 60 characters desktop, 45 on mobile. Don't forget to cluster search results to help people jump to relevance faster. That means kind of show different categories, maybe as tabs at the top or things like that. Maybe also show different like, diversity of different options right there, both in autocomplete and in search results. Support the scroll by range intervals for precise jumps. This is where you have your list. And then whenever people start to sort by something, you display maybe some pointers to what is expecting them where. This could also go for pagination. Autocomplete can do much more than just keywords. It can also suggest filters, products, categories, scopes, anything else, presets, whatnot. There's a lot of options that you can do there, but you really need to spend a lot of time thinking about what, how to make autocomplete good. It's not straightforward, right? Unless you use some third-party solutions, of course. Um, also, when it comes to expert users, they will want a lot of um, advanced features. One of the most requested advanced features for expert users is to option to customize details in search results and also combine this with some sort of logic, but you don't have to do it and or not and so on logic and with an advanced search. It could be just a part of one single search and filtering experience. And whenever you can, decouple the filters from results so that whenever people select filters, they're not frozen, they're not waiting, they're not blocked, they don't need to wait for their website to come back, right? And that's a whole, kind of also a very useful pointer because if you have popular filters that are used a lot, you might want to integrate or use them as sorting types as well. But for sorting, I probably want to first jump into your questions for another like half an hour and then wrap up with explaining a little bit about uh, sorting. Before you go, right, uh, I just want to remind everyone that we do have this little thing that's smart interface design patterns where you find all of this stuff just complete, right? Because it's, like, I recorded, I think, like three and a half hours on search and filtering and pagination and infinite scroll and all of that. You'll find quite a bit of stuff in there. And if you use the coupon code search, it gives you 20% off. We try very hard to make it affordable for everyone. If it doesn't work for you, you know, please let me know. I'll try to make it work. There is an email at the bottom of the website as well. Um, and also if you have, let's say a team, we can also have like a team bundles, whatever. So it's actually worth for you, your colleagues and so on. Um, I'm really bad at promotion, but uh, I should mention this. And also one thing, by the way, which I hope is very useful. We do this training every now and again uh, where your team can participate. Um, and also we add uh, five more lessons every year for free. So you get it once, you get it forever lifetime access and everything. And it's relatively affordable. It's like at this point, $250 or something. It's not expensive. Right. So with this, also one final note. This, my friends, is the story of my life. I have to admit that you can try very hard to make your search impeccable, but every now and again, you have considerations which are beyond your control and that's fine. If you still get to make things a little bit better, that's still worth something. And hopefully some of the things that we covered today will help get there. So the world is unsatisfying, but that's okay. We as designers can live through this and be successful in it. So here is, dear friends, the story of my life in one minute.
It's so unfair. It's so unfair. The pinball pattern. Right there. For designers. Huge thanks to the wonderful people of the Parallel Studio for making this video happen. Uh, what a wonderful video that is. A little bit sad, but true, right? Very much like our workshop today. So with this come cats and more cats. And of course, we also have some wonderful workshops coming up. If you go to Smash by Online Workshops or Smash and Conf, you will find them. You also registered through their website. And we also have some wonderful conferences coming up this year in Germany, in US, and also in our beloved, wonderful Antwerp. Uh, all around design and UX, and then front end and UX in New York, and then the good old web in Freiburg uh, later this year. Well, with this, now and thank you so much for coming, everyone. If you have to leave, feel free to leave. But I'm not leaving until I answer the last question. So I have nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. And we still have some sorting stuff to figure out, um, which is going to take like another 10 minutes. But before I do that, let me jump into questions. Uh, all right, I think Raphael has one. Just before I let you in, just a moment, Raphael. I just want to check how we're doing in terms of Google Doc, because I now promise that I'm going to answer every single question. And if there was a hundred of them, of them, I'm going to stay here until uh, forever. Uh, by the way, all the examples that you have seen are also here. So you don't have to like take the notes and stuff like that, right? So it's all right here. Uh, but let me just jump into Google Doc and see what's going on over there. Oh, we needed to create a third one because there was a, a lot of stuff. Oh my God. Oh no. Oh no, I didn't see this coming. Okay, well, I'll try my best to answer as many as I can. Uh, <laughs> all right, first things first. I think that uh, we also accept questions that came through the raising hand. So Rafael, go. You'd like to yeah sorry uh first of all vitaly thank you uh that was really uh full of insights um start of the the the, the workshop you were mentioning uh pagination um as a strange pattern um but you did not mention That's the true. infinite scrolling uh pattern what what, what about it uh, on search results oh you just opened up a big pandora box Raphael. you're really good at this aren't you <laughs> You really are. So I have this big section about infinite scroll also in the video course, right? But the um, gist of it is this. Let me just briefly show you what I mean by that. Uh, so that was uh, live. Okay, I need to jump between different in different deck right here. Just a second. So there are some issues with infinite scroll. Uh, well, of course, a lot of uh, accessibility issues, for example. Right, let me just jump here. Here we go. Right, oh, I like it. I like it. You see, sometimes I am organized. If you look around here, this is a disaster. But that is organized, so that makes me happy. So there are, of course, a lot of issues with this thing scroll. If you want to make it better, there are ways of doing that. Uh, specifically, what I would say, what I would highly recommend, is to do something that would be similar to. Uh, to this. Let me just double check. We also have, of course, for example, Google, right? The search results have changed. Now, if you scroll down, you don't have pagination anymore. It's gone. Instead, you have load more button. So if you click on load more button, then you get to see more. It's kind of almost like infinite scroll partially. So what works really well uh, to, you know, to fix all of these issues, because it's overwhelming, difficult to manage, has high abandonment rate, people can't copy the URL and things like that. We can get it right. And I had to get it right. It's just a lot of work. Right, but it's you can get it right. So here's an example. So this is a uh, crash field, right, which we saw previously, and here's an example of what we could do here to improve infinite scroll. Now, right now, you know, eventually when you start scrolling down, they get to this point where they have a button saying "load more products." All right, so you click on "load more products," and then what happens is they show you this overview. Well, they don't show it now. It's just a mock-up that I, uh, that I created, right? Where you can say, hey, uh, you know what? If you feel like you want to leave now, you can send and leave us your email and then we'll remind you and give you a link to continue here later. We could do something like this. Or we could also do something like this, which I think find actually more useful. You scroll, eventually more content loads, and then you have a button saying continue here later. You click on it, then it stores your space. The next time you come to the page, it realizes that you've been here before. So it tells you, hey, we'd like to continue where you left off last time. If you have dynamically generated content, uh, items and new items coming up, you need to display them, of course, as well. But that could be a nice way of doing it. 
But if you really want to fix the infinite scroll, what you need to fix really is uh, access to footer being one of them, right? So that means at this point, you have this Damakan, which is a food delivery service from Malaysia and has a sticky footer. Problem with the footer solved. On the other hand, what you also want to support as infinite scroll is an ability to save state of where you currently are. And you can do that by combining pagination, load more, and infinite scroll in one. This is pepper.pl from Poland. And if you look at the top, you see this URL. And as you keep scrolling, eventually that URL changes. Why does it change? Well, because what you see here is infinite scroll, which paginates through pages by appending content from each page to one single stream. You also have a sticky footer, so you can always access to, well, jump to the footer if you want to. And you can also use paginator, like move to page two, or you just scroll. It's kind of infinite scroll, missing pagination, eventually also with load more. If you had to design a better infinite scroll, I would go with this, not just regular scroll, because you absolutely have to fix the footer, footer problem. You still need to make sure it's, a, it's accessible, by the way, which is not going to be easy, right? And you might want to allow people to maintain the state so they can copy the link to where they currently are and move somewhere. That's not a simple implementation, right? It is not, but that's quite neat. And just a moment, Kyle, before I bring you in, right? There is also other kind of patterns that you can apply here. This is another example from Germany where they also combine, uh, what, what was that? What did they combine? I think infinite scroll, no, load more and uh, pagination. So you can say, I want to see more. You can choose how many products you want to see, but you can also get pagination. So infinite scroll alone is definitely not enough. If you want to go that route, you probably will have to play quite a bit uh, with implementation to make sure it's accessible and it fixes all these problems that infinite scroll usually has. That's a very quick answer uh, to your question. Right. Okay. Uh, Kyle. Hey, thanks, Vitaly. Um, sure. So I, I work on library research databases, similar to Semantic Scholar. And so a single database might be used by students that range from high school through grad school. And so these groups have vastly different information literacy and search skills. Uh, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on general approaches for designing search experiences that have to support a really wide spectrum of user yeah. skill uh, and that have especially high information density content. Right, very good point. Thank you so much for that, Kyle. So I'm working right now with the European Parliament, right? And we have the same story because we have internal users, we have external users. So they are coming with quite different interests and quite different inquiries. Uh, the ultimate goal that we have decided to go with by studying what are the common tasks that people are performing as external users and internal users by looking at just how much overlap they have. And we say, okay, 70% of the tasks that or topics that both of those parties are interested in are similar. 70% is a big overlap. If you have, let's say, an overlap of 30%, you might need to actually start thinking about slightly different experiences for different groups. So if you have a big overlap in tasks that people are performing, topics that people are interested in, and so on and so forth, then you probably can get away with one single navigation, one single search for everybody. So we got to the point where it's 70%. If you have an area where you have very distinct groups, like... Uh, maybe the overlap is, I don't know, 20%, 30%. You might start considering actually either different entry points for them, like different sites or subsites or whatever, right? Or if you have one search engine that supports them, you might want to have kind of these buckets of filters that would allow them to uh, kind of find those filters that are relevant for them faster. I would never go with advanced search button. If I could, I would try to avoid it. What I would try to do is say, Okay, there are all these fields that we have. Can I structure them in a way or um, uh, group them in a way that people who need them will access them, but it doesn't really get in a way for people who don't need them? That usually means maybe search box underneath these popular buckets of different filters, the ones for experts maybe rather on the right, the ones for everyone rather on the left, but all appearing because they're most important ones right under search box. But then the rest would still be visible maybe on a click on a button or so. So if you have, let's say, very distinct roles, I would say either maybe looking into like really good filter presses to different entry points, 
though it's you need to maintain two different search engines people will get lost they will go to that search or that search it might be tricky if you could i would try to still make it work within one but then provide different path for people to walk through successfully to the results if it makes sense but it depends really on highly on the overlap of the tasks that people are performing on the on the site or in the search right Excellent. I have 722 questions to go through in Google Doc. So hang tight, everyone. We have nowhere to run, right? Oh, wonderful to see you on here as well. That's fantastic. Anastasia Sarolink here, right? Excellent. Okay, so uh, with a lot of fear, I'm going in into the call-up doc. I don't know if I really, I mean, it probably requires a separate session on its own. Oh my God, this is, uh, and this is document number one. Okay, let me just go for some of them and kind of highlight some of the important ones, right? Inference scrolling, we covered that. How do we effectively communicate search parameters to developers? Oh, that's a good point. I would say, I would say the answer to this question will rely on what kind of search we have and what kind of metadata we have. So I'm not sure if you absolutely need to have um, every single piece of metadata surfaced or available to everybody necessarily maybe you might want to prioritize that first and that requires bringing people in and seeing just observing or just basically doing some research to understand what people are searching for and how people are searching what kind of filters they're using what kind of parameters do they find relevant and then do some prioritization right there that's probably what i would do and then actually surface it in that way so we need to have these features available but then we probably want to design it in a way that is not overwhelming. It doesn't. It should not look like it's, you know, techy, uh, even although it might be for expert users. How different the search behavior when users are in their forties and fifties? Frankly, I don't know. I haven't studied this. I don't know. Will they also focus on mobile uh, versus desktop? I don't think it's really different. I mean, I covered a few things about autocomplete. It just everything is a little bit faster, and so people are more reluctant to open links. That's I know for sure. Because whenever you open a link on uh, on mobile, that's really a commitment. Because you waste a lot of time going back and you can't really just open a new tab. People don't open many tabs um, on mobile, right? Okay, that's unusual. There's a lot of free extra. Right? I'm sure I didn't cover that. I'm pretty sure that's a little bit unusual. What about search for enterprise, where this might be a main search box to navigate the app, but a second search bar for more specific functions like reporting? I'm wondering if you could actually integrate both of them in one. So if you have, let's say, a scope of sorts in your main search bar, maybe you don't need a second search bar. But I mean, whatever works, right? It's ultimately up to the point if it's actually been tested or not. Very often it isn't. And that's a problem, right? Because you might have people just typing one search query in the wrong place. Uh, I would try to avoid second search bar if I can. How about uh, opening search results in a new tab or using the same page? Is there a proper behavior? Oh, that's like a long story. I remember writing an article back in 2006. Uh, let me see how it's called. Um, why links should open in the same tab, I think. Oh, not number one. You see, I'm pretty bad in search maybe. So let me see here. Oh, should links open in new windows? July 1st, 2008. Um, I kind of give an answer to that very quickly, I think. Maybe I was wrong. I'm not quite sure. I'm going to drop it in the chat over here. People need to have a choice. I mean, you can, of course, have a conversation about PDFs opening in a, in a new window by default. External links open in a new default, in new windows by default. Just let people be. Let people select what they want to select. I mean, I, I haven't done specifically any research on that recently. The last time was 2008, right? Um, but I would say that most of the time, oops, opening in Sorry. a, that's closed. Uh, most of the time it should be, you know, just let people be, they should be able to understand how to open a new link if they want to. Lauren is writing that uh, having trouble getting to the payment page of the course. I hope it's not too overcrowded now. Sorry, maybe you could try again a little bit later. I do apologize for that, but I don't think I see any any issues there. No alerts about things going down. Sorry. Maybe you can also drive, send me an email if you want to. I'm going to drop in my email here. By the way, if you have any questions, you can also drop them over here. I left my email here. So I'll try my best to help you. Right, And also can connect on LinkedIn, of course. Just uh, saying. Right. 
Okay, so that's that. So I would say no. That would be a very opinionated and very bold answer. What's the benefit from duplicating search boxes on the page in example with a mortgage? Uh, I think the example there was that they are trying to allow people to search within search results. I don't think that many people get that. The same example we had in the University of Antwerp on the top, right? That's problematic. So I would say, if anything, I would rather have a search box with an option to select, like it would be might be opting it for or selecting an area where you currently are, and then you'll be searching over there. Maybe that would be also an exception where you could potentially have a second search box. I'm not quite sure, frankly. Uh, that's all ultimately about testing. Let me check what it was on Lloyds Bank. I don't remember. All right, so that's... Oh, right, right, right. I'm not quite sure, frankly, why we have two. So if I search for insurance... Hmm, I don't know. That's quite surprising to me as well. I'm not quite sure why we have two here. I don't know. Uh, good point, though. I haven't noticed, you see. Uh, search blindness, I guess, at this point. I would love to see the number of results per tab listed on the tab with that design pattern. Oh, yeah, uh, that for sure. I can do that. What about pagination? Because you'll figure out that what you search is not on the site. I know that for sure when looking for the pages. Thoughts about that? For me, it feels like a good process to thoroughly go through the content on my search results. Make pagination more favorable to me instead of infinite scroll. Yes, I would say indeed, but from the experience that I had and from the observation that again, Norman Nielsen Group has confirming, it's really rare that people go beyond, let's say, page two. It just doesn't happen that much, if I'm being honest. So I'm not sure if pagination is going to get you more results. There is a big study, by the way, that was done by Bemert Institute around that. Uh, just let me show you as well, because I have it right here. Pagination is the most popular, but also the slowest solution. Users browse significantly less, again, not going beyond page two, and often feel slowed down. But they spend more time on the first page because they have to refine filters uh, and use filters and sorting more. Right, not surprising. When we look into loading behavior, this load more pattern, it works best. Well, it worked best. It was five years ago on mobile and on desktop. Give users control. All items are on a single page. Footer is reachable. Users browse more than on pagination and focus on single items, often scrolling up and down. And then, hold on, let me just go to infinite scroll as well here. Right, very overwhelming. Users often dive right away into exploration mode like we do here, but they scan fast, they focus less on single items, and it often feels like it's out of control and they also have few footer issues. So I would say, yeah, I, I wouldn't prefer, I wouldn't say that pagination is always working better. Probably isn't, if I'm being honest, but it probably will be heavily dependent as well on the case you have. What does the site looks like on mobile? Still have the tabs clusters? Well, let's take a look. I don't know. I'm curious at this point. So here we get, oh, yes, we do have these tabs and we have this more when you actually can select what you're looking for, right? There might be different ways of looking at this. This is one way. You can also, maybe in these cases where you have so much space, I would probably say view all and then it would expand and show it across different lanes, maybe, but that's also tabs. So it might be tricky. Yeah, that's how it works here. What are some objective metrics or measures for search quality? Again, this is usually going to be the quality of top 100 search results for a given year. That's kind of at least a metric that we are using, right? Uh, Ilya is wondering, is it me or did you forget to drink water? I had my water in the break. I promise, Ilya, I did, honestly, right? Is it possible to purchase the 10-hour video courses and the future purchase and live worship separately? Uh, yes, so you can just get the video, video library we don't really call it course because it grows over time. And you can also uh, get the live workshops later. It's just, we have the one coming up in a week. And so we, it's kind of sold out already. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure why we have this. This makes me a little bit irritated. Okay, sorting. I'll talk about sourcing in a moment. Recommendations around UX research for enterprise search software. Well, if I have to give a choice, I can only tell you that what we have ended up using is Algolia. Algolia is a French startup. There are many, I mean, I cannot just say, okay, this is the one, right? But we have very good experience with Algolia. So I'm not affiliated by any way. I'm not getting any credit or any money or anything. 
right, from the recommending it, but we had a very good experience in terms of speed, accessibility, everything. Can't complain. I know some people using Elasticsearch also quite happy. Again, I want to emphasize one more time that it's the matter or the quality of metadata that is ultimately deciding how good your quality, how good your search is, not necessarily search engine. Of course, if you have very outdated one without all the complete and everything, that's a bit of a story, right? Um, we need query suggestion to reduce interaction costs more, especially on mobile where screen is limited. Probably so important, but not enough. Oh, I think it, it would take me a while to get through this. If you send me an email, I'll be happy to look into this, but I think it would take quite a bit of time. I never suggest using an all query, but I feel like the end query among asset queries or asset management software is prevalent because the user wants to narrow down a huge table. Could be. I mean, what I mean is really, it kind of really depends on what logic you have. By default, it might not be what you're looking for. So I just want to make sure that you actually have the right one. And I'll be quite careful with grayed out options. Um, some people don't understand why things are grayed out, although they might need them. And they might be locked out. It's not like we have a lot of options. I wouldn't hide them, right? So tricky, but you know, you, you just want to make sure that you're actually testing what you're designing over there. Any recommendations for dynamic filters that are dependent on the data within the search result mixed with normal filters? Yeah, so usually what you do have is whenever you have, let's say, one filter and you want to show more filters, just use a simple accordion. You don't have to kind of, kind of display things, um, kind of have, have filters kind of jumping in once you selected a particular filter. If, however, you have a situation where depending on some conditions, you need to show more filters, maybe they just dedicate a specific area for that that would be appearing below the filter that you have selected, not above, because that would push the filters down. I hope I understood the question properly. How do you design a search interface when you know that the underlying metadata is incomplete? Yeah, so you could of course hint at it in your search results that something is missing, right? Or will be available, uh, hard to say. I mean, ultimately it's not going to help you much. I mean, probably the best thing you can do at this point is to indicate in some way or give a hint that uh, it's not complete, but it, we're working on that or anything of that kind. I always remind me, uh, it always reminds me of a visit I had in a wonderful restaurant in Whistler in Canada. Uh, when I went for Quebec, uh, for poutine, and the, when I entered, there was this little table there. It was very nice and very cozy, but it was a little bit broken in the in the food. And they had this huge sign on the table, huge sign saying, "Sorry, we are working on this. It will be done. It will be better." Like I wouldn't even notice, but you're so kind. I love you already. And first of all, I also love poutine. That's a separate story. So maybe just explain and. I like that, like, okay, well, we are still working on it. That's fine, right? Recommendation for open source search engines. I haven't tried them, to be honest. So I can't give really good recommendations, right? Let me just double check the other ones. I hope that there is not a double, like the same num number of questions over there. So dear friends, I wanted to spend maybe seven more minutes on those questions first before I dive into sorting. Just wanted to wrap up because I promised. Oh, we have more stuff here. Okay, not that much. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to finish the first page, and then I dive into all sort of sorting, and then the content is done, right? And then I'm going to answer the rest of the questions. Patrick, I agree. I love Quebec. I've been to Quebec many times. I have absolute admiration for Putin. If anybody comes to me and tells me that Putin is horrible, they are wrong and I'm right. Because Quebec and Putin are impeccable. I love Putin so much. There are two things in life. This is very much off topic, but who cares? There is Putin, and then there is Francesinha. Anybody from Portugal here, by the way? There is, this is absolutely magnificent. Absolutely amazing. This is probably the weirdest thing I've ever tried in my life. It's, there is Putin, and there is Francesinha, and nothing in the world can top it. Nothing. Francesinha is like a sandwich where you have a lot of meat, cheese, eggs, and it's all like you have a lot of cheese and bread and then you have an egg on the top. And then you also have it all, as far as I'm remembering correctly, in a beer sauce. That's absolutely amazing. Incredible. This should be a part of everybody's meal 
once a year at most because it's very unhealthy, I heard. So that's very much off topic, but yeah, get back. Here we go. Um, if you need any other recommendations about really bad, not bad, like unhealthy food, let me know. I'm happy to help. You know my email address. Right, moving on here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I think this was another one. This was the third one. This was the first one. All right. Okay. Uh, da -da -da. Could you talk about no results pages? What is the best way to present it and opportunities in this scenario? Well, ideally what we would want to do is to maybe give people some hints around how to get somewhere. So if we know what they're looking for, maybe we could suggest some results that they would need. Like if you look at AI, for example, uh, what, what I'm really missing in many of the AI interfaces is this option to scope results or to scope um, the output to something, to video, to experts, to a particular domain, to anything like that. You have to write it out. Not everywhere, but in ChatGPT, you have to write it out. And what I wish on no results pages is to kind of track what people are searching for and suggest maybe queries or filters or categories or topics that would actually be relevant. I think that could be actually quite helpful as well. I have a search and creation button on my navigation bar, and they're both important. How visually represent them so there is no conflict between them? I mean, it's fine if you have, let's say, a search that takes up the entire width. If you have a search that is important and you want people to search, then you probably want to show that search box, right? That uh, probably would be important. How to visually represent them? I mean, you could probably just either put them in one line if it fits, or you could just have a dedicated line for search, right? While well, you also have that button right there. What about breadcrumbs during search? Are there things to avoid? Breadcrumbs are difficult because very often they don't represent the path that people have been going through. Um, they can be useful, especially if they live on in Switzerland. By the way, again, greetings to wonderful people from Switzerland, because I discovered this wonderful pattern for breadcrumbs, which is absolutely astonishing. And that's coming from SBB, which is the railway uh, system in Switzerland. And so you get, you know, this, and let's say we have this search over here, and we search for whatever, right? And so what we get here on those pages is this breadcrumbs dropdowns, right? Which is very nice. I think it should be pretty much everywhere, which is like breadcrumbs, but they also act as navigation. So you can actually jump to neighbors of this category, of this category, and so on, right? That's actually really, really cool. And uh, it's also been repeated in, across other different sites, like admin.ch uses something very similar as well, or used, maybe not anymore. I'm not quite sure. It was here, but it's not here anymore. Hold on, just check very quickly. Uh, you see, I have no idea where I'm clicking, but I don't know anything about this. But there was something like this across the entire page, right? Basically, you have these breadcrumbs showing up menus right there. Very cool. So breadcrumbs, great stuff in general. Just one thing to keep in mind is that very often you don't find them on search results pages because they don't really belong there. Um, so they usually don't appear in search. Okay, maybe just two more minutes on this. Is it my place as a UX designer to impose more order in search metadata? If I talk with an engineer, I feel like it is not really my place to do something that changes a critical thing. Well, as a UX designer, my role, for example, is to make search better, make sure that people actually find what they're looking for. If they don't, that's my problem. And so I need to work with engineers to make it better. Metadata is a very crucial part. That's why I would say that what we need in teams that really desperately care about search they need to hire a search designer or search specialist or anybody who understands search, both from the editorial perspective and the technical perspective. We really need this. Very often, search is just a side activity that some designers and some engineers do. If your search is important for your organization, you need to invest in search. And I don't mean it on the level of engine, but on the level of people who are maintaining and actively managing this engine, right? And the data that, have, that we have there. That's uh, really significant. I'm actually quite impressed that we have 250 plus people and still also like 100 people-ish on uh, YouTube. That's, thank you so much for staying along, right? All right, the final one before I move on to sorting. Do you have any examples of search where the user don't necessarily know what they're looking for, but rather encourages exploration? I mean, typically when this happens, you would be seeing a lot of cards where people can navigate from one to another and explore it, or it would be happening by navigation. When people don't know what they're looking for, their search queries might be very broad, 
And so even if they type in, let's say, something like, uh, I don't know, uh, Romania, let's say, in search uh, engine, we probably want to display this bulk of different topics to guide them there. So if it's a broad query, we just need to support it as well. And again, as you have noted, probably from what I've been speaking about, I'm not a big fan of just relying on keyword suggestions alone. That's usually just not good enough, right? Okay, so I'm going to just make a break over here, right? And I'm going, I, uh, I didn't forget, I will reply to every single question that we have here, don't worry. But just before we do, I know that some people might need to leave and do something else. I just want to finish what I promised because we haven't spoken about sorting and sorting is very important. It's really underrated. So I want to cover that in 10 minutes and then we should be able to kind of wrap up this part if it's okay with everyone. Right, sorting. Sorting is different from filtering. We know this, but we need to understand how it's different. Because if filtering is a hard boundary that helps people reduce options, if you select some filters, you basically filter out stuff. Sorting doesn't do that. It's a soft boundary that helps users rearrange what they already see. We know this, but it's important to keep in mind, right? Also, as you remember from the very start, like what we what we spoke about like two hours ago, right? People first search or browse using navigation, regular navigation, then they filter, then they sort. It might be then they start sorting at the point where they actually see some results, right? But usually search, filtering, uh, sorting or navigation, filtering, sorting. Sorting often comes in the last place. Often doesn't mean it always, right? So sorting really helps when people don't have a strict range in mind, but they kind of want to navigate whatever they have in front of them in a more comfortable way. That means that usually they want to get to this real comfortable range, as we call it. 20 items maybe on mobile, or it depends on if they're experts or not. 20 to 75 items. That is really uh, comfortable for most people. Expert users can go away with, can go ahead with 150 to 100 items. What I mean is the number of results that they're going to see when they actually have searched, right? And the key that we want to get there is to really help them to get to that so-called so, so comfortable range is to provide useful sorting options. Sorry about all the text, but we want to get people to a selection that's easily manageable and highly relevant. And sorting is great at this. It really is great at this. So let's take a look at some examples. This is what you typically see. You see things like this appearing, like you have a sorting button that often leaves next to filters button. That's expected. Your sorting and filters should be close to each other. That's very important. People perceive this kind of sorting behavior, even as part of filtering. That's why it's not surprising sometimes to see interfaces where you have a sort and filter button in one. That's normal because this is also how people perceive it. Or sometimes you would have just the filter button. You click on filter and you have an option to sort there as well. In either of those cases, it can work just fine, right? As typically, I would try to separate it so you have a sorting option and filters, but they would be very close to each other. It can look like this, like a little drop down, like a little overlay over here, all this. The same patterns that we saw with filters as well, right? Nothing fancy there. You can do a lot of stuff with sorting. One of them is when people are sorting, check when they are sorting. This is a very old example from Amazon, which is fantastic. Why? Well, you are looking for dry cough and you're looking at everywhere on the entire site. Of course, you get a lot of results. You might be getting like thousands of results here, right? So before you start sorting or when you start sorting, you need to select the department when you actually want to sort. Because sorting this humongous list is absolutely irrelevant if it's not scoped to what you need. You're not looking for just dry cough for everything. You probably have a specific thing in mind. The sorting, by the way, can come up in very different ways, so in very different um, uh, shapes, I should say, right? Uh, it could be like relevance, price, alphabetical, brand, newest to oldest, cashback, quick shipping, delivery options in e-commerce and so on, availability, you know, all of the stuff. The best sorting types are the ones that are customized to whatever people are searching for. That is really important. So let me give you a few examples on that. This is iHerb, right? And iHerb, you know, sells vitamins and all the stuff, right? So you will, of course, have things like featured and relevance and bestsellers and so on and so forth, right? But they also have things like heaviest or lightest or highest discount that might be relevant for some people, 
right? So that's kind of cool at this point. Beyond that, you can also go way beyond that, right? Here, we are selling bikes, right? We can also go, of course, with regular stuff, the relevance brand and so on. I don't think it's good enough in 2024. We need to get a bit better than this, like this maybe, right? You want to sort by fat or you want to sort by carbohydrates or cholesterol or anything like that. That's very specific to what people are looking for, right? So that's helpful. Or you might want to actually sort by this. If you're looking for TV screens, what we can do is we can say, huh, what are the filters, the most popular filters that people are selecting when they're looking for TVs? Right? Oh, well, they're looking at screen size. Okay. They're looking at refresh rate. Okay. They're looking at display depth. Okay. Each of the frequent filters that people are using a lot is potentially a candidate that you might want to use to allow people to sort by that value if it's quantifiable. Like if it's color, you can't sort it, right? It's just ridiculous. But if it's a number, like screen size, refresh rate, things like that, things that people use in filters a lot, you might want to surface it as an option to sort by this value as well. Does that make sense, everyone? Right? So that's really helpful. I mean, I cannot emphasize enough. This is not utilized at all. Most of the time, sourcing is just relevance, featured, best match. That's not good enough. It really isn't. You can drive people very quickly to results. Like, for example, again, for the European Parliament's case, one of the ideas is, well, we should probably have something that people are looking for. If they are typing, let's say, Ukraine, and this is maybe like on one of the pages or one of the sections which are related to law directives, like legal directives. Well, we need to include the option to sort by directive number. Right? Maybe that will be useful or anything like that. If this is a common filter that people are using, we might want to utilize it as a sorting option as well. Right? And I think it's worth mentioning at this point that the worst sorting, the worst default sorting you can have is price or alphabet or the big list. So you type in category and you jump into sneakers Alphabet does not help you. This is useless. Most of the time, alphabetical listing default as a default is absolutely useless. Price as well on big category pages that actually just have everything. You really need to nudge people towards specific areas first. And the reason for that is not because I say so, but because the first impression that people make, right, is what they see on that category page. If the only thing they see is something that is like, $5, $6, $7, they will expect that this is the entire website. They will not even maybe spot that it's sorted like this by default. So if you have, let's say, by alphabet, it's the same story. If the only thing that appears in your sneakers page in the top 10 results is Adidas, well, then people will be assuming that this is the entire website has nothing but Adidas, right? Which is maybe not what you have to offer. So keep that very kind of close in mind. What is better? You know, whatever is relevant for people. Maybe it's featured items. Maybe it's relevance. Again, the same story. When it comes to those search results pages, we need to show with diversity of different options. Right? That's actually really uh, important, an important part of this story. Right? And also, I mean, there is a lot of options of things you could do with sorting. Right? Favorites being one of them. New, price high to low, price low to high. That's standard. But you can do more than this here. Better discount. Like, if again, Mintra... From India, right? The the default the sort by is recommended, whatever that means, of course. But then you also get better discount as well in here. This is eBags where they have our picks recently marked down and things like that, right? And this is also nice when you get to reviews. You might want to be able to sort by skin type, right? That's only relevant combination of normal, dry, or oily, or age range, or skin shade. That's very useful to sort by those things because they are really quite important to people potentially. And when you display them, sometimes you might have directions, right? Because you could say descending, ascending. I see a lot of people struggling a lot with descending and ascending. It's like, you know, to me, it's like 12 p.m. Every now and again, I have to wake up and okay, 12 p.m. Is it now midnight or midday? I always forget. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I always have this trouble. Right? So the same goes with the sending and ascending. Some people get just confused by that. And you can use a sort by drop down, sort button, sort of filter menu, it doesn't matter. Right? And also, ultimately, you could, of course, do this, right? Where you have price up and price down. But what does it mean? Like, what does it actually mean? Are you sorting from what to what here? What does it represent? Now, A to Z is clear and Z to A is clear, but this is not. I'm just not quite sure what this represents. 
that's a little bit confusing. So there are, of course, many different options. And probably what you would be preferring is trying to be as clear as possible, either by lowest price or price low to high, but probably not ascending, maybe not arrow, that's just confusing, not low uh, uh, hyphen high, right? Maybe lowest price, maybe price low to high, something of that kind might be better, like this. Price high to low, price low to high, that's a little bit more obvious again at this point with those uh, sorting directions. And if it's something that actually just provides a benefit for users, you might want to highlight it as well. Like for example, rating, instead of using ratings high to low, you might just say best customer ratings, right? Or highest ratings. You don't need to indicate this kind of um, uh, direction at all. The same goes for TVs, right? If you're looking at uh, instead of TV display depth low to high, which sin sounds a little bit robotic, you could say TVs by thinnest display, right? So that uh, might be actually just a little bit easier to understand. And of course, sometimes you also get just a little bit more messy sorting, like this is the last one, I think, like multi-sorting, where you not, don't just sort in one direction, but in multiple directions. That's especially common in enterprise applications, where you might have a situation like uh, this, that's Airtable, and in there you have the sorting button, and that's a very common pattern that I've tested and it works really well. So it looks like this, like it's very similar to filters, but you actually add more filters as you go. You click on the sort button, and then you can select where what you want to sort by first, and if everything is the same in a particular column, let's say you can also sort by a secondary value, and then by the tertiary value as well. And that looks then like this, right? have this overview and then of course you can say sort i want to sort by this and you apply manually and then it gets applied or you do it kind of automatically right where you basically mark states and then it changes automatically so that all happens basically just through this where you can say i want to keep sorted so it kind of auto updates automatically as you keep going through but you basically just add one filter and then another and then the third Sometimes it also leaves on the level of uh, a table like this, right? You might have an option, you click on a header and then it gets like a right click and then it gets, you know, sort by this. And then maybe sort by something else. So you can actually have multiple options at the same time over there, right? And finally, oh my God, I can't believe that so many people actually still here after this. Finally, the one really underestimated pattern that is very helpful for sorting is faceted sorting, right? Not faceted search, faceted sorting, where we want to give people a way to sort better for whatever it is that they're actually looking for, right? For example, again, when you look in dry code over here, we have these different options that people can select from to sort. So give them categories, maybe like this. They can sort by relevance, but also they can choose a subcategory to sort within by relevance. That could be another option, right? So you nudge them towards more relevant entries or more relevant results right from a general page. That, of course, would be most useful in general pages, and that's where you need to track. In general, I would say if somebody is typing in, let's say, a topic or it's just a big, big section um, that you have, you probably want to nudge them towards, you know, choose a subcategory because this will ultimately bring them to better results, right? And sometimes you will find actually some websites doing that relatively well. So Walmart being one of them where they actually allow you to sort by two things at the same time, by relevance and also by price low to high. It's not necessarily just one, but it makes the logic a little bit more complicated, right? And the final one, I promise, because I think that I don't have anything else. I'm running through all, out of my slides here. We need to be very careful about how we're sorting ratings. Right. If you look at what patterns people are looking for in e-commerce or any kind of recommendations, the best rating you could get for your product to sell really well is something along the lines at 476. 476 to 4.8 is the best you can get. If you do that for a product, you'll be best seller in no time. People don't trust 5.0. People don't trust 4.98. People trust uh, just, you know, it cannot be perfect. It cannot be perfect. So no, 4.5, uh, sorry, 4.7, 4.8, something in that range, right? And in fact, most people will be looking for this specific pattern that you see here. They need a lot of good stars and some poor stars. That's a pattern that people are looking for, right? However, when you look at more systems, the way they implement ratings is like this. You basically get the average 
where you're sorting from high to low. So many sites, for example, will position a product with a single five-star rating before a product with a 4.8 star average and 18 votes, which is not helpful, I should say, right? There is a study, there are a couple of studies done. When you actually ask people, well, it's always this you know, strange story asking people because you need to monitor what they're doing. Right? That's the best research. Right? You cannot just ask what they would do, but people tend to trust and buy products that actually have higher average, uh, lower average, but more ratings. So if you select between 4.5 star average and 5.0 star average with two ratings, more people will choose this one. The same goes over here. So people do prefer lower averages if they have more ratings. Right? And the reason why I say this is because there is a famous formula, which is this one. Yes, for the first time ever, I included a math formula in my presentation around sorting. Very happy about that. Where, which is called the Wilson score confidence interval for Bernoulli parameter, which is usually implemented in every single search engine, if it's modern, that will sort ratings in the right way to avoid these kind of situations. If you are a math nerd like Jan, who is probably floating in space now, or in Aurora uh, Borealis, you can also look at this wonderful video, which has, by the way, one freaking million views about binomial distributions, which is fantastic because it covers what you need to know as a developer, engineer, or designer about ratings and how to rank uh, ratings and organize them. Fantastic stuff. Yes. I managed to sneak this in. <laughs> so proud of me. All right, summary. <sighs> Many people don't see sorting and filtering as separate tasks. Usually they will be swoosh, scroll, and sort, which means they scroll up and down, up and down, or they paginate ahead very quickly, right? They kind of see the sorting and filtering as the same story. Use a search for sorting above the list, not in the sidebar, so you need to keep it there and close to the filtering button as well. Also, another suggestion, which I kind of recommend you to test, always repeat sorting options at the bottom of the list as well. As people scroll down to the top, to the bottom, you can actually keep going and maybe change the direction from there. Especially if you show, let's say 25 items in the list. Um, alphabetical order is really the most useful sorting time. You probably want to rethink that. Default sorting gives people a perception about the entire list. And don't hide popular sorting options behind an icon. The same story like we did with filters and search. If they are important, you probably want to highlight them as buttons. And if you do use buttons, then you can probably use sort by button, sort button, which kind of opens an overlay, or sort and filter menu. That seems to be working fine as well, right? Oh, we managed to get through all of this and you're still here. That's impressive. It's like 232 people are still here. I can't believe it. I was expecting like five, uh, but that's uh, quite impressive. So that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover around Filters, sorting, search, and all of them are really interconnected. And as you can see, it's not just about like making things a little bit better. That's, if you want to make it good, like you want to make a really good search, that's an adventure. That's not straightforward. It's not easy at all, especially if you have a lot of metadata in front of you. All right, questions time. Let me drink some water. <laughs> just a moment. Oh, I have coffee, but I shouldn't be drinking coffee. Just a second, I'll be right back. Water is a fantastic liquid, I highly recommend it. By the way, dear friends, I see a few people sending me a message about payment errors. I do apologize for that. I'm not quite sure uh, why. Uh, please let me know in the email if it doesn't work. I'm going to try my best to make it work. Right. Here we go. Now the adventure number two. Uh, Amanda, I hope I, at this point, feel free to leave. I mean, I don't think it's, it's uh, it, I mean, our wonderful team uh, can leave because again, I don't know how much time it's going to take until I answer every single question. That might take a while, um, but I don't think that we will be breaking into rooms anytime soon. All right. Okay. Can you talk about why it's important to have some text or sneak peek near the respective search result item to help decide if that's what they want to check out? I guess we're also looking at something like placeholders at this point. Hmm. I mean, placeholders are inspirational, 
right? And I think this example that we saw in MIT, for example, I really like it in a way, right? So we here have this search and then we get this kind of suggestions, I guess, which are inspirational. I think it's okay. I don't find it problematic at all, as long as you kind of surface the things that are people actually are looking for. So if you look at, say, at gov.uk, it's kind of a very similar pattern right there. But what we have here is like we have this dedicated section for what is popular right now. And that's kind of helpful because if you have, let's say, a text declaration time and you can jump right to text declaration form from here, that's great, right? Uh, I think it's actually quite fantastic, right? Here, I hope it, I mean, I hope that those things that we see here are kind of highlighted or selected based on what people are looking for most of the time. So in that way, I kind of find it quite okay, quite valuable, um, but it must be valuable, right? So for that to be useful. In e-commerce, would it make sense instead of autocomplete awards to show directly the products? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, if you look at hema.nl, sometimes I feel like I know websites more than I know people. That's a little bit sad. For example, I don't know my neighbors, but I know the websites really well. I have like a relationship with websites. That's probably not a good thing, but uh, here we go. So him I know fairly well, and not because I'm shopping there all the time. Okay, that's weird. I cannot click that button. That's it. I'm not going to visit Hema ever again. They blocked me. That's very disappointing. So if you try to go to Hema.nl, you'll see that whenever you start searching, they also show you the product suggestions right there and prices too. So, you know, it's just really sad. Come on, Hema, let me be. Okay, I, I, it's just it. I, I can't, there is no way for me. Okay, so here we go. So that's totally, yeah, absolutely. Uh, perfectly fine to show directly the products as well. How would you approach the decision-making process for choosing the appropriate input interface for a search feature? For example, the traditional search results filter interface versus an AI chat interface for the alternatives you have presented. Um, so, so, okay, so I think like, there are different patterns there. So on the one hand, when they're looking at AI interface, uh, AI interface can be helpful in order to help people, to guide people to the right products as well. This is just how you present it. In the end, it could also be giving you suggestions and you can speak to it or anything like that. That's all fine, right? Those things that I presented, they're kind of universally helpful. So if you use AI, fine, that's no problem. Then instead of maybe having, you still will have probably text input or maybe you'll be speaking to the interface, of course, right? but then you probably want to still have access to filters and maybe presets. So as you start talking to AI, it can give you those presets right out of the box. The same idea. But then when you present those items, products, whatever, right, then you probably kind of want to give people a sense about um, the diversity of the product that they have. So it would be the same pattern. So it wouldn't be really significantly different, frankly. Any thoughts on showing the number of search results behind the filter criteria? Yes, also a good idea. No harm there at all. It's just whenever you actually select a couple of filters, you want to sum them up and put them on the button too, like show 200 items or whatnot. Going back from a search result in the browser, ideally, should it go back to the search results or the previous stage of the selected result? Yes, we had this discussion actually. Um, usually, it's not common that you will be polluting the history, well, browser history, by returning to the previous state of the search. Um, that's maybe not expected. I don't know if I can give the right, like the only answer there. Hmm. I would probably say it should go back to the previous page, like to the search results rather than to the selected result. But it's more of a hunch. I haven't tested it, I don't know. When a filter has 30 plus values, what is your preference for displaying them? For example, text filter for the list or see all results link, which opens the full list in, prior, in place of a light box. I would say if you have 30 different values for like a brand, let's say, uh, in that case, um, I mean, you, you, I mean, sometimes if you end up with really long list and people will just not go to the end of the last, let's say, filter. So you might want to have this accordion when you click on show all values and then you expand. But when people refresh the page or apply a filter, you probably don't want to close it automatically. That's important part. But that it also, that's also where it gets a little bit messy. And if you have a filter that has more than 30 values, what I would highly recommend you to do is to include a search within that filter as well. So people can jump to a specific filter of their choice faster. 
If you search in a calendar, how would you sort the results by relevance or by date? Mm. As a default, I guess. Relevance typically is more useful, but I would probably have then two buttons on the top saying uh, relevance or date. I would say hard. It's, it's very difficult to say. We also have struggled with this situation with this question because if somebody's typing in, let's say, uh, like Ukraine at this point inside of the European Parliament, what should be appearing first? Should we be sorting by relevance or by date? Frankly, I would assume that by date will be mostly less relevant than sorting by relevance, frankly. So I'd probably sort by relevance first as a default. What is a relevance filter search sort on a block website? Uh, is there any alternative to a drop down? I mean, you can also have buttons. I mean, if you look at, say, at the city of Montreal that I sh briefly showed, right? Oh, Quebec. Mm -hmm. This is Quebec. Uh, Poutine oh, brings back memories. Uh, so if you have here, like, we have these buttons here, which kind of, well, they look like buttons, but they're basically literally just links. But then whenever you're searching here, and let's say we type in education, all right, we have these little kind of drop downs which I kind of like as a pattern in general. And again, it's kind of decoupled from the search results. So you can actually look for things relatively quickly. So that's a nice pattern to have. So I would say if you have a blog that then you could probably do this. If you have those different, say different topics, you might want to highlight them this way. That's I think is actually quite nice. And then you still have these activated filters right here and you can clear them all as well. That seems to be a good option right here. Excellent, page number one, done. Moving along. We have part number two. Oh my God, I <laughs> I don't think I can do this. <laughs> okay, let me see. Maybe I should record. Oh my God, this is uh, uh, a lot. All right, let me just maybe start. I think I think I under overestimated things. Uh, regarding pharmacy search example, do most patients default to searching symptoms to, for any scenario, including doctor search, or only for medication? Um. Hard to say, I think that we need to support both. We need to support both symptoms and also any kind of medication that they're looking for by basically tracking what they're searching for. I guess that's the best thing we can do here. Uh, I don't know, I, we didn't do specific any research around patients. I, I just was not involved in a project like that. How important is it to immediately show and remove cards when e-commerce searching? Or can I let the user press enter so that I don't have to load items all the time? I would say, Test, of course, but I would personally say that it might be a very good idea, actually, to let people select everything, all filters first, before showing them any results. If you have, let's say, filters on the sidebar, there is an expectation that there will be a real-time update of some sorts. If you have filters above area, the content area, above search results area, then it might be perfectly fine because you will have this drop-down, and then once you select some filters, you'll be saying, okay, uh, show these items. So I think that's perfectly fine uh, if you actually show them, um, not automatically, but on manual apply. I would try that. I don't see a lot of issues with that, frankly. If anything, it just slows down the page less. So consider maybe that. Accessibility considerations to look out when designing a search page. Tab order and visual order be the same. Are there any big advantages of using input type search versus text? Oh, that is a good question. I think there was a big debate from Scott O'Hara about input type search, but I don't remember what the outcome of this is, right? There was a big story around search element and what is better. I'm not up to date at this point, but I can only highly recommend you to drop in this article and read about it. I remember a big discussion, big debate about this from accessibility perspective for screen reader users. Uh, what I can tell though, is that of course, basically the visual order and the tab order should be logical, pretty much going from top to bottom, right? So that's uh, what we're expecting. And then of course, if we have thumbnails or anything like that, it's just like content on a the page. There shouldn't be big surprises over there. Opinion on thumbnail photos, next to suggested search results. Position relative to text, something like this. Um, I would say if it's so far away, that might become a problem because people need to spend a lot of time scanning. If it's on the left, which I think is also something that Google does a lot, that might be supporting your query. That's fine. That's actually quite helpful for, uh, for like product searches. How does metadata become a problem in search function? 
Well, if it's poor and polluted and really poorly organized, you end up in situations where you're typing in something in autocomplete and then you get all kind of mess. That's just bad, right? So this is usually poor metadata, poorly structured metadata is really an issue. How can we ethically use machine learning to return results which benefit the business users towards success or other metrics? Ethically to return results which benefit the business users. Is there best practice around algorithmically presenting results and how do we communicate this to users? I think what I really would love to see is something that, um, that uh, let me just remember what it was. I think LLM was the article, large language models. What was that? Uh, just a moment, because I know this for sure. I'm going to show you in just a second. We have a wonderful speaker speaking about this. Who would that be? I think it will be... Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. No, not here. Hold on, just a moment. Oh, yeah, here we go, Maggie. And Maggie wrote this wonderful article about different patterns for language models, which I think is really, really, really cool here. So I'm going to drop it in the chat as well. Here. And one of the ideas that she had here, that it would be nice to have this model or this pattern that she was calling a demons pattern. And the idea behind it, that you would have different roles, different personalities that you can speak to. And then based on, let's say, something, like you can select, let's say, a particular part of the response and say, I want more references to that. Or I want to see sources for that or anything like that. I think that's really important and very valuable. And I think it should be actually just appearing by default. So whenever you tap, let's say, on a particular section, it could be telling you, okay, where it's coming from. That would be quite useful. Still, AI has massive sustainability impact and really a lot of sustainability costs. So we need to be very cautious about how and when we use it. But in many ways, um, I would say the most significant part, at least for me, would be to see how we can help people waste less time on the website. Because when we're speaking about sustainability, for example, we're not just speaking about less waste on websites, but also just people not wasting minutes going from one section to another. That's the one important part of digital sustainability that's usually not spoken about. Giving people's natural inclination to skip ad-looking search results. What's stopping search engines from making ads look like normal search results? Well, they do that, I think. Uh, most of the time they do. As you look at Google, it's very, sometimes it can be quite difficult to distinguish between uh, sponsored uh, results and actual results. Are there any legal implications that require ads to differentiate from regular, result, re, uh, regular results? I think there was a big commitment to that in India, if I'm not mistaken, to prevent this from happening. Uh, and ethically, it's of course very questionable if it actually would look exactly the same. So that kind of would undermine trust that people would have for sure. What books would you recommend to learn about practices for advanced search? Oof. Uh, good question. Uh, I don't know, frankly. I would need to look. So if you send me an email, I'll probably try to find uh, some books, but nothing comes to my mind right away. There are some classics uh, from like 2006, 2007. But I would say it's probably the best one that I would highly encourage you to read is a book on information architecture. Uh, oh, this one which is, by the way, freely available for the time being. So you can go ahead and download it. It's a fantastic book, right? And it was very, very kind from the offer to actually make it available for everyone. So you can download it and start reading it ahead of right, right away. Fantastic book to organize IA, metadata, everything. Really, 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 really good, right? Okay. Um, how would you present the user an already visited link without using only color? Mm, yes, so I, I there is a nice series about colorblindness right here, which I read in and out, right? Uh, and from what I know, when you look at blue and purple, that is indeed a problem, right? That is indeed a problem, um, especially for all the audiences. I never thought about it this way, frankly. Um, Well, I think that the more important part is that at least it looks different. Maybe we need to look into different uh, lightness. That might help already. That is a really good point because if you look around it, at it, blue combining blue and purple is problematic. Right? I think there was a notion somewhere. Here we go. You might want to avoid purple and blue because as people age, 
they get to um, they kind of lose the ability to distinguish between the two. So because we have purple visited links and usually blue regular links, that might become an issue indeed. So shapes always help, of course, right? But uh, I'm not sure if you want to have that in uh, visited search uh, results. But usually what helps is to reduce lightness, at least create some contrast by that. Right here. So many patterns. How do you select one for our products? How do I know what will work better for us? Um, I don't think it's just a lot. It's just very different facets of the experience that we looked at. For example, I have this general idea about what I would do with search results. Uh, sorry, with, with search boxes, right? I would have a search box and I would have the most popular filters next to them, either on the right or below, available at all times. And then there would be more filters buttons. So you click on it, you see more filters. That's me. And then of course, on that button, it would not just say search, but something like maybe show X results. That's me. I know exactly what I would do on mobile as well. Mobile, you click on filters, you have full overlay, you have all these filters, you have the button at the bottom saying show X results and you have a close button or something like that on the top right corner. That's it. When it comes to filters, yeah, it depends. If we want to, if we can decouple the search results from filters, you can put the filters on the left, you can filter, put the filters on the top, that's fine. Either way works. But when it comes to selected or applied filters, I would never put them in a sidebar because whenever you start interacting with filters, they would push down your filters so you will not be able to quickly select them. So filters always above search results. Pagination always below search results. Sorting both on the top and at the bottom. Now that's search for me. I wouldn't necessarily kind of reinvent the wheel every single time. What's your suggestion for showing complex scientific data table results? Oh, I think my dear friends, I will not be able to manage. I'll probably have to wrap up in four minutes. This is just out of control at this point. Um, maybe we should have a dedicated session for that. Uh, suggestion to show complex scientific data table results. Or oh, where can I get more information about that? Complex scientific data table results. Uh, well, just today, by the way, I just published this little overview that I always put together every now and again. Uh, just a second, let me see. Here we go, this one. Where you find uh, everything that you ever wanted in your life and maybe more, I hope, at least. So this is this link. So if you look at LinkedIn, there is also stuff around data visualization, data tables on desktop and on mobile, right? I hope that you will find some bits over there. There's a lot of stuff here. Also for accessibility. Right, so that's it here. Okay, two more. Please, uh, I, I don't think I can take it anymore. Uh, do you have any tips for showing multiple scopes with a single search bar? Drop downs versus tabs versus other options. Oh, yeah. So you know, some that's a very good question. That also brings me back to Montreal, and again to Poutine, I guess. Because when I look again, okay, it's in, I don't speak French, unfortunately. What they also have is these little things here, which kind of bring these little boxes, right? So I would say that sometimes you see the search where you actually can add, like almost add those filters or scopes as these badges within the search box. That might be worth exploring. I think that this is cool actually on its own because you cannot use drop down because it would allow only one option. Although of course you could have a multi combo box as well. That would be probably two options I would look at here. A uh, good example of Bento box search results pages. Bento box, I assume that one of those that I showed from uh, Arnuido, Arnuido, Arduino, sorry, might be a nice one, right? Where you're looking for, let's say, uh, I don't know, software, right? And can I get this? I really like this presentation, actually. It's, it's for me, this would be like a really relevant example of how you would do this. I'm just not sure about the two search results pages, but you see here, we don't have the second one. It's probably global. Yeah, so that's kind of a different story here, right? Uh, the iPattern study. So this was also done by, um, Normal Nielsen group pinball pattern here. So you can take a look. They also have a couple of other search studies on that as well. So you can actually look, and they also did one on mobile too. So you can take a look at that as well. Right, accessibility already covered, right? Uh, is it the same page? No, I think it's not. Um, go to resources to help choose between options. 
Mm, basically, uh, this stack, that's that thing that you see here, that is also available, by the way, as a PDF here, right? That's my reference. I use that. That's kind of my way of collecting all of those things together in one single place. So I just do that. I don't think there are particular resources that I would go to, but ultimately I kind of explained, right? So I have this kind of idea of what I think would work best. And my goal is really to make sure that people are, have very difficult time finding, uh, making mistakes, right? Uh, then I don't know, I already mentioned, why should we trust only Google when there are much better and specialized search engines out there? Well, I think that we, it's not like we have to trust only Google, but this is the experience that many people have in their day-to-day -day life. So this is also the expectation that they come with when they start using our experiences. So the minimum that Google provides is also what is expected from us. I'm not saying we should just repeat what Google is doing, but we probably want to learn what people are expecting from a search engine in 2024. And I would say that their expectations are much higher than what we deliver in most of our search um, interfaces, right? Uh, mobile, usually we prioritize based on what we, you know, the diversity and the relevance. So that would be kind of just stacked. Right? Okay, dear friends, I think I have to wrap up at this point. <laughs> this, I think that the more I speak, the more questions come up. But thank you so much, everyone, for coming in and for staying all this time. Uh, I hope that you found some useful bits in there. As a quick reminder, you find a lot of stuff over here. We have this video course with a friendly coupon code that will be active for the next two days or three days or so. I don't remember. Uh, we have a lot of these examples over here and resources and sources that I mentioned here as well, right? So feel free to use them as well. Feel free to send it to your friends and colleagues. I don't mind. As long as people benefit from it, I'm happy, right? Thanks so much, everyone, who joined us on YouTube as well. Um, Happy poutine time, everyone. If you have a chance to access poutine, please go for this and think of me as you en enjoy that journey. Thanks so much for joining, everyone. See you next time, hopefully in person this year. Thanks, everyone. And bye-bye, everyone.